Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the council meeting. I declare the meeting open at three minutes past six. I'd like to start by acknowledging that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. First item on the agenda is apologies and members on leave of absence. Acting CEO, have you had any apologies submitted? Uh, no apologies as such, although I am aware that Councillor Harley is running slightly late. Thank you. We'll assume that Councillor Castle's in the same position and we'll proceed. Um, we now move to public question time. So I'd like to welcome you all, uh, members of the public gallery, to our meeting. This is your opportunity to come up to the microphone and address an item on the council agenda this evening. Um, we do ask that you state your name, your address and the item to which you are speaking. And we do request that you do stick to no more than three minutes. So um, the CEO will be timing and we do that to maintain an efficient meeting. So there's no set order, it's just whoever wishes to come forward. And I see Peter Mujer moving to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, good evening, councillors, um, elected members and, and City of Vincent officers. Uh, my name is Peter Merger from Urbanista Town Planning um, at 231 Boer Street in Perth and I'm here to speak to item 9.2 on this evening's agenda in relation to the application for two two-storey group dwellings at 48 Agena Street in Mount Hawthorne. I'm speaking in support of the officer recommendation for approval um, and thank the officers for their work during the assessment process. Um, in relation to not number 48 of Gina Street, you know, <clears throat> it has a total of 612 square metres and is zoned residential R30, allowing for the property to be subdivided into two lots, which has occurred in this instance. The subdivision proposal for two lots on the site has been conditionally approved by the WAPC and the application before Council is tonight is to provide a development outcome which is consistent with the density of the area and the subdivision that has been approved. Notwithstanding, it is noted that the proposed development has several variations which require <coughs> the discretion of... Yeah, do we have any responses to previous public questions taken on notice? Uh, no, Mayor Cole, there are nil. Um, and any applications for leave of absence? No, there are nil. Thank you. So now we move to the receiving of petitions, deputations and presentations. And I have received a request to present a deputation from Mr Damien Carraha in relation to item 9.2. So Damien, please come forward. Thank you. So we're now moving to item 6, confirmation of minutes, and they are for the ordinary meeting of the 18th of September 2018. Could I please have a mover and seconder? Moved Councillor Lowden, and seconded Councillor Murphy. All those in favour? I declare the minutes carried. Um, announcements by the presiding member. I just have a few upcoming events to mention. Things are hotting up and we are heading into events season. Um, on Thursday morning, we would like to invite everyone to a community bike breakfast as part of the Ride to Work Week celebrations. That's happening at Oxford Street Reserve this Thursday morning between 7am and 9am. Um, we've also got the Garage Sale Trail happening again this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. And I'd like to say that it's really great to see the Vincent community embrace the Garage Sale Trail. I've had a look at the website and again we see a huge uptake in our area. We've got scouts running a car wash, kids holding their own garage sales, neighbours banding together to do street garage sales. So I'd encourage everyone to check out garagesaletrail.com.au to see the map to see what's happening in Vincent. Um, also, on Sunday afternoon of the 28th of October, City of Vincent has teamed together with um, WAM, WA Music, um, to uh, have WAM Fest live in North Perth, where we'll be holding a series of free music events over the North Perth area with something for all ages. So we've got events happening at the Rosemount Hotel. We've got an all-ages um, concert at North Perth Town Hall and a silent disco for the young kids in the alleyway next to Milt. So that's all happening simultaneously in North Perth. Perth would be a great day to be there. Um, also proud to announce that we're again supporting North Perth Local to um, support them in their pursuit to make Ango Street a free and fun community Halloween party for all. That's happening of course on the 31st of October. It's from 4.30pm and there'll be live music, face painting, spooky photo booths. It's always lots of fun. City of Vincent will be out in costumes walking the streets so that'll be fun to see. Encourage all the council members to get on board with that. Um, and if anyone would like any more information on these events, it's all listed on our City of Vincent website under events. 
Um, CEO, do we have any declarations of interest? Uh, yes, Mayor Cole, I have four declarations. The first one is from Councillor Loden, who's declared an impartiality interest in relation to item 9.2, Agena Street, Mount Hawthorne, two group dwellings. The extent of that interest being that Councillor Loden has a personal association with one of the affected residents through his involvement in the fathering project. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Loden's impartiality on the matter may be affected. Councillor Loden declares that he will consider this matter on its merits and vote accordingly. I have another declaration of interest affecting impartiality from Councillor Josh Topperberg in relation to item number 9.7, uh, 599 Beaufort Street, Small Bar. The extent of that interest being that the applicant is a client of Councillor Topperberg's business. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Topperberg's interest on the matter may be affected. Councillor Topperberg has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. I have a declosure of um, financial interest from Councillor Jimmy Murphy in relation to item 9.9, .9, which is the relocation of the deletable town centre taxi zone. The extent of that interest being that the Leadable Hotel donated a gift uh, during Councillor Murphy's election campaign. As a consequence, there may be a perception that Councillor Murphy's interest on the matter may be affected. Councillor Murphy is not seeking to remain in the chamber or vote in relation to that matter. And the final declaration is from Councillor Jonathan Hallett, who's declared an impartiality interest in relation to item 9.10, the proposed 40 kilometre area wide speed zone trial. The extent of that interest being that Councillor Hallett lives within the trial area. As a consequence, there may be a perception that his impartiality on the matter may be affected. Councillor Hallett has declared that he will consider the matter on its merits and vote accordingly. Thank you for that. Um, before we initiate um, deliberations on the items, I'll just go to the council members to see that if they have any other items they wish to bring forward for debate, in addition to those already raised by members of the public gallery or those that are absolute majority decisions required or have financial interests declared. Councillor Hallett, Councillor Murphy, Councillor Loden, Councillor Fatakis, Councillor Toppleberg. Um, just uh, item 9.7, only because I wish to depart the chamber, even though I declared impartiality, I don't wish to be in here for the debate or vote. Uh, so 9.7, um, and 11.5 and 11.6, please. Councillor Gonshevsky. Thank you. Nine point six, was that? I'm going to move another table. Council members, those in the gallery and those live streaming, I'll now read through the list of agenda items which Council will adopt the recommendations of on block as they are listed in the agenda. 
that is items 9 9.9, 9.10, 11.1, 11.2, 11.3, 11.4, 13.2 and 18.1. Um, I don't think that we'll deal with the 18.1 on block if that's okay. Let me just pull that one out. So all, all, of, all of those listed except for 18.1. Um, sorry, I will also ask that 9.10 be pulled out as well. For, for clarity, I will just uh, again read those items that will be voted upon on block. They are 9.4, 9.8, 11.1, 11.2, 11.3, 11.4, and 13.2. Council members, can I please have a mover and seconder for the on block items? Move Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Gondoshevsky. All those in favour? Declare the on block items carried. Um, just to explain to members of the public gallery, the way that our meeting procedures work is that we go through the items of the agenda firstly in order of those that were raised in the public gallery in the order that they were raised by members of the public. So there will be a bit of jumping around at first as we go through the items as they were raised originally by members of the public gallery and then I'll go back and go through sequentially for those items that haven't been um, addressed. So the first item that was raised from the public gallery was item 9.2, which is 48 Gina Street, Mount Hawthorne, two grouped dwellings. Could I please have a mover and seconder for this item? Or we can just, yep, thank you, Councillor Toppelberg. Councillor Loden seconding. Uh, try and make it quick and simple, and uh, I don't support the officer recommendation. Uh, I, if you look at how this presents to the street and the street, the street setback and the anomaly that was mentioned in terms of uh, subverting the R code, even the intent of the R codes in terms of the garages uh, is, a, uh, is a planning anomaly, but the, the design principles are, and I say this openly and fairly, if we can't prevent buildings like this being proposed and built in these areas, our built form policy needs to start again because it is precisely what it's there to try and assist uh, applicants and community to be able to not do so that we end up with a better result on the street. This is effectively two, two garages with a house stuck on top of it and I think that we can do much better. And whilst the, uh, the uh, applicant's representative has pointed to the technical non-compliance of the setback, it is significant and if that's all that we have to, uh, to debate, I do think that the design principles uh, aspect of its presentation to the street in terms of the uh, the, the dominance of the uh, garages and those two solid garage doors in particular uh, is something that, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not palatable and I'm, I'm not supportive of the officer recommendation and would gladly support the alternative. Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I won't label the point either. Um, I think this has been covered in quite a bit of detail in deputation as well. Um, the only point that I'll add is just around specifically the landscaping requirements of 30%. Um, I don't see how this development can achieve that 30% because of the, the large uh, mass bulk that is in there. This development is fundamentally just too large for the space that it's been allocated in. Thanks, Councillor Odin. Any further comments, Councillor Gondoshevsky? Look, I, um, I agree. Uh, Council Topberg and Council Loden. I also, but I also don't accept that the development um, actually meets the deemed to comply provisions around um, the garage either. I don't believe that the design has successfully managed to minimise the perception of building bulk to the street, and I think the garage is really dominant. Um, and I, I think that essentially the, the overhang of the balconies is not sufficient to have mitigated the sufficient bulk of the ground floor design. Um, and I don't believe it's, the garage is subservient to the dwelling. Um, I appreciate that the designers tried to deliver for their client in the context of a difficult subdivision, but I won't be supporting this one. Councillors. Um, look, I'd just like to make some comment in relation to um, the 
setback and the fact that when Council deliberated on our built form policy, we made a very clear decision in relation to maintaining five-a-side measurements when determining uh, setbacks, front setbacks, particularly importantly in established neighbourhoods where the uh, neighbourhoods like Mount Hawthorne, which were R30 predominantly under local planning scheme one and have been remained at that zoning under local planning scheme two. They are not transitioning areas and we made the decision that we would not become, um, we would look at our, clo our code setbacks in transitioning areas such as activity corridors and transport corridors, say for example Loftus Street where we were looking at higher density development, we had up zoning, this was an area where we wanted to encourage apartments to be built in our neighbourhood such as uh, Mount Hawthorne and in this location we made a very clear policy decision that the five-a-side rule would continue and it, it is quite disappointing to see this officer recommendation come forward in relation to the setback. Um, that is an issue that I have raised and will continue to raise. I think that it is really out of keeping with this setback. It's a relatively intact streetscape as, as, the, um, as the members of the community that live there have been able to demonstrate and I just was not convinced by a lot of the um, commentary in the officer report, and particularly around the overhanging balconies reducing the prominence of garages. I think that the um, the set forward of the garage of the balconies in conjunction with the um, dominance of the garages presents a double negative and I think that that is not um, acceptable and I agree that the, um, that the deemed to comply provisions around garages being complementary and subservient to the dwelling have not been met in this regard so um, I don't support the officer recommendation. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put the officer recommendation. So we're voting for all of those in favour of the officer recommendation. All of those against? I declare that motion lost. Is there an alternate recommendation that any council member wishes to bring forward? Councillor Gondoszewski. I'd like to move the alternative recommendation on the pink, please. Um. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Lowden, do you wish to speak to it? Councillor Gondoszewski? I mean, I think it, this essentially reflects um, my reasons that I felt I could not support the officer recommendation. I don't, I believe the street setback is um, uh, detrimental to, and, and is certainly not consistent with the established streetscape. And I also believe that um, the um, visual dominance of the garage. Um, is excessive within the streetscape and, and certainly compromises the character of the street. Councillor Lowden, do you wish to speak to it? Just briefly, um, just to say that I'm supportive of... Uh, uh, so I guess there's my uh, alternative recommendation for refusal. Uh, effectively, uh, Councillor Gontoshevsky covers the same thing but with the addition of the uh, clauses around the setback of the garages and carports, which I'm comfortable adding on effectively. Um, uh, just one other comment is that um, the report refers to uh, number 26, 28 and 30 as examples of properties that are quite set forward. Um, looking at these, the first two, 26 and 28, are single storey dwellings, so for their visual impact on the street is much lower and they're actually quite small developments. Um, and then number 30, although it is two storeys, it has the garage at the front and then it's articulated with the second storey at the back. I think the developer needs to give some consideration to something more consistent with that, um, recognising that then they'll also have to address the, the carport, the size of the carport issue as well, that it doesn't visually dominate the streetscape as well. Councillors, any further comments? Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. I'd just like to propose an amendment, if I may, to uh, Clause 2. So uh, the design principles of Clause 5.2.1, setback of garages and carports, comma, 5.2.2 garage width design principle P2. Can I have a second of the amendment? Should or I read what design principle P2 is before yes, we please, go? Yes, please go ahead. Garage width. So um, during the deputation, uh, Damien referred to the uh, because it's a greater than one metre setback between the garage and the upper floor, there was no need to assess against the deemed to comply, but it's actually the design principle which is required, and the design principle reads, visual connectivity between the dwelling and the streetscape should be maintained, and the effect of the garage door on the streetscape should be minimised, whereby the streetscape is not dominated by garage doors. 
Is there a second of the amendment? Councillor Lowden. Councillor Topperberg, do you wish to speak to it further? Only to say that I do not believe that the uh, effect of the garage door on the streetscape is being minimised by it not dominating the street. Councillor Lowden, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Sorry, that was it, it was an addition to number to number two, not to number one. So it's after clause five point two point one, setback of garages and carports. Yep. So if we just cut and paste and put it in, it's in clause two. Apologies for that. So it's clause. F yep. Uh, and it's a design principle P2, just to be specific, that it's not the deemed to comply because that doesn't come into it. So after word garage with in the brackets, if we just put design principle P2, please. Does anyone wish to speak to the amendment? OK, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Back to the substantive. Any further comments in relation to the sub substantive motion? Um, look, I just will flag a question that the issue of the uh, uh, capacity to achieve the 30% landscaping has also been raised. Um, I'm not sure whether that's something that Council also wishes to consider. Um, it may go without saying that if you increase the street setback, therefore you have the capacity to increase the landscaping, but it is also an opportunity to um, add that if, if there was a, a will of Council. So whilst people are considering that, if I'll just speak briefly to the... Um, to the motion before us. Just in relation to the comments in the assessment uh, and just more broadly about street setbacks and about outdoor living areas and again the, the applicant has chosen a four by three configuration and that does present some limitations in terms of outdoor living. But one of the things that defines particularly North Perth, Mount Hawthorne and Leaderville within the City of Vincent is the activity that goes on within the street setback and the opportunity to actually provide well landscaped uh, this, is, this property sits uh, on an east-west facing uh, lot, which means that uh, the provision of northern light to both the front setback and to the rear setback, uh, well certainly to the southern property by the nature of the development, there's almost no northern light afforded to the rear setback and you actually may, uh, with clever design, actually may get a better and more usable uh, uh, outdoor space within the front setback if it's well landscaped uh, and properly you know, if the, in terms of privacy you can certainly fence uh, using uh, using appropriate hedging or otherwise but those front setback areas could actually become quite well used so that to me that there is no sense of compromise on uh, the outdoor livable space it's just a matter of whether that's located at the front or rear of the property I don't think there's any obligation to have uh, the garage so dominant and all of that outdoor living uh, space concentrated to the rear Councillor Lowden. Uh, I have an additional amendment uh, which would read the development does not satisfy the clause C 5.14.4 of the built form, form policy as the development is not able to achieve 30% site coverage. Yeah. Canopy, yeah. Canopy, Canopy coverage. coverage. Thank you. Um, do I have a seconder for that amendment? Seconded Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Lowden? Councillor Hallett? Just um, make sure we've got the wording before we move it. I'll give, um, give Emma and Natasha a little bit of time. Emma, would you like the wording repeated? Yes. Um, Councillor Lowden, would you mind repeating the amendment wording? Uh, the development does not satisfy the uh, clause C 5.14.4 of the built form policy as the development cannot achieve 30% of the site area be provided as canopy. I think just need a coverage on the end there. Canopy coverage, I would suggest. Canopy coverage. <laughs> Keep on leaving that off. Is 
Is the mover of the amendment satisfied that it's captured? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, all right. Was there any further debate on this amendment? It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further comment? Okay, I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? I declare the amendment carried. We're back to the substantive. Any further comment in relation to the motion? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour of the motion? I declare it carried. Uh, the second item that was raised um, by a member of the public gallery this evening was item 10.2 and that is minor parking restriction improvements <coughs> amendments. Can I have a mover for item 10.2 please? Thank you Councillor Gondoshevsky. <laughs> Can I have a seconder please? Councillor uh, Vitakis, thank you. Thank you. Um, look, I'm supportive of this. I think we are um, working towards an integrated transport plan or um, with some other perhaps more inspiring title. Um, and I think that, that through that process we're going to um, hopefully be able to um, have a really solid way of dealing with um, parking. Um, however, I, I don't agree, you know, I don't think we need to sit on our hands. Um, while we wait for that document to be delivered, and we, it's important that we start to consider um, some, you know, being able to tweak and respond to resident requests um, or where, where parking issues are identified by our community. Um, I had I, I had thought that I would propose an amendment in relation to providing notice to residents within a particular time frame of the um, uh, works occurring um, to allow for residents to, in lieu of, you know, official consultation, to allow residents to um, understand and ask any questions about the works that would, were going to occur. Um, I'll see. However, I have looked at the plans and I'm, I'm pretty satisfied with these in terms of um, impact on, on residents. So, um, uh, actually, I, I will listen to the debate and I may propose an amendment once I've got my head around some wording. Thank you, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Councillor Fatakis. I just think in these instances um, we always have to be prepared to listen to the community um, and seek um, improvements and amendments as they um, see fit. I'm, I'm happy with, um, um, with the, the proposal as it is. Um, I didn't, personally, I didn't see a need to actually extend community consultation with this, like um, Councillor Gondoshevsky, I looked at the, the report, I felt that um, the changes um, that are being proposed um, are quite clear. Thank you, Councillor Fatakis. Any further comment? Okay, look, I'll just um, make some comment around um, Mr Kemba's fantastic advocacy on behalf of his neighbour, which, has, which he did point out has been a 12-month effort, and I do thank him for his efforts, and I think he's been such a good neighbour. Um, I think the issue was that when Mr Kemba came to count to the City of Vincent, he did receive... Uh, he did receive um, a level of service. He we met with the director. They had a discussion about how they could uh, approach this issue, and he was told that um, that the administration would prefer to leave it as is. He then appealed um, to myself to take the matter further, and at that point we decided that the matter should come to council for determination. But in the interim, I think that the director has come up with a good solution, which um, really does meet the needs of of the neighbour who is um, unwell, and that I think this has been appreciated by himself and his family in um, having access to his home. So um, I think it was a good outcome and again I thank Mr Kemba for his advocacy on behalf of his neighbour. Um, look, I did also think that um, should we be advertising, but I think when you actually analyse the changes, they are relatively minor. Um, I think if we were cha making changes to car parking all the way around Kalgoorlie Street and um, the uh, Braithwaite Park, we'd be looking at some serious consultation and uh, we would need to look at consulting with the school. We wouldn't be wanting to make whole-scale changes while the school build is going on, but we're looking at the new um, angled parking, some of which you know, is 
has replaced what was probably about five bays is now was the figure around 14 or 19 something like that so um, so and in relation to the mosque I think well it, it appears that there's a lot of changes to resident only parking when you actually look at the map it's quite minor and it's tweaking because these roads are very very small and narrow so there's it's quite minimal I think and it is um, obviously um, designed to increase the ability for the Perth mosque to attend prayer time while respecting the rights of residents at the same time and trying to find that balance so quite happy to support the officer recommendation and thank the directors for their joint efforts. Any further comments? Thank you, um, Mayor. Through you to the director. Can I just double check um, in regards to the streets surrounding the Perth Mosque? I, I'm aware of those issues over a long, um, a long period of time. So I actually think this is a, it's going to be a good, um, good outcome. Can I just double check? So have. And they are small streets. The mayor's absolutely correct, but I guess if you've been used to, you know, having that resident-only parking for a very long time, it, they might maybe small streets, but big changes for the for the people living there. Um, can I ask whether there's been any discussion with the affected residents? I'd be interested to know that, and also with the residents who have um, permits there, will they still be allowed to park their cars? During the day, or will it only be after the um, hours of um, you know, at 6 p.m. through to 8 a.m.? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, in response to your first question, Councillor Harley, no, there has not been any direct consultation with the residents in the surrounding streets. Uh, the changes to the resident-only parking areas on Robinson Avenue and, and Brisbane Place, uh, what they are ultimately is allowing non-residents to park there during the day. Um, those with uh, residential parking permits can continue to park in those streets during the day and then they'll have exclusive use of the, those areas at night time. Councillors, any further comments? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Thank you. Okay, the next item raised this evening from the public gallery was item 9.5, which is number 8 Moy Street, Perth, change of use from single house to unlisted use short term dwelling an unauthorised existing development. Can I have a mover and seconder for this item, please? Moved Councillor Hallett, seconded Councillor Gondoszewski. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Straight to the point. Um, the litany of concerns raised by neighbours is enough to convince me not to support the officer recommendation on this one. Um, there are places in the city where short-term accommodation is appropriate and would add to amenity by bringing visitors to town centres and tourist hubs, but this doesn't fit that for me. Removing properties out of a long rental market is not something I support generally and certainly not in this location which has such a strong sense of community and has already experienced a range of impacts on their amenity uh, from this premises being used for short term accommodation without any approval so I won't be supporting the officer recommendation. Thank you Councillor Hallett. Uh, Councillor Gondoszewski. Um, I will uh, echo Councillor Hallett's comments and save uh, my more extended commentary for an alternative should it be forthcoming. Thank you, Councillor Gondoszewski. Any further comments from council members? Councillor Fatakis, please, I'm sorry, I think I've still got jet lag. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've heard, the, as other councillors, um, heard the concerns of residents and I've long admired the commitment of uh, residents in this precinct to building um, a great community precinct and um, really heartened to see so much of the community here uh, tonight and last week. Um, and a lot of the efforts that have gone into this precinct to create, um, you know, an internationally recognised um, uh, heritage um, heritage uh, precinct and a, a really great sense of community. And a lot of the words that have been um, echoed tonight, and I can see amongst um, the relationship of uh, the people within the gallery, there is obviously a very close uh, community um, within both the Bookman and the and the Moore Streets. Um, I did read with interest, um, having come, you know, operated within the property industry for close to 25 years, the owner's contention that the change of use um, is a solution to his difficulty securing quality long-term tenants. And I would like to note that um, we are 
in, I suppose, moving towards a rental property shortage. Um, again, so we're seeing the 7% uh, vacancy rates last year move to 4.1 to 4.5%. So I hope that does give him some solace as I, um, again, like um, the two councillors before me, um, I will um, uh, not be voting for the, um, the officer recommendation. Um, I don't see that changing the use uh, is a is an acceptable solution, and I think, um, in fact, it will actually cause great de detriment to uh, the residents in that area. So I won't be supporting the re officer recommendation for that reason. Thank you, Councillor Vitakis. Further comments? Um, look, I'll just make some brief comments just to state that I also don't support the officer recommendation. Um, this is a very intact residential area. It's a very low zoning, one of the lowest in the City of Vincent, and coded R25. Um, and I think that it's very concerning when you hear that neighbours are taking security measures in response to what has been author, um, acting as an unauthorised use where we've heard neighbours talk about um, being fearful returning to their homes, we've had people make changes to their security in terms of cameras and locking gates. Um, so um, look, in terms of the, as Councillor Hallett described, as the litany of issues brought forward, I think that where Council has discretion to look at an unlisted use in a residential area, it really has to be on the basis that we can see that there not be an impact on residential amenity. And I think that the case is very clear that that is not what would occur in this situation. So given that there's already um, a, a range of issues identified on how this has impacted the amenity of the existing residents, it's not compliant in relation to parking and it's effectively introducing a commercial use into a very well established um, residential low zone um, low zoned um, residential area I don't support the res the um, the application any further comments councillor Harley sorry, just one question through you mayor um, in regards to um, if the alternative recommendation if this goes down the alternative recommendation goes up can I just ask um, what happens in regards to compliance in regards to this dwelling? What are the next steps? Through you, Mayor Cole, if the application before you is actually refused uh, and it's uh, substantiated that the landowner is indeed running a short-term accommodation facility at the moment, uh, the City will commence normal compliance action. Uh, that would invariably start with a, uh, a letter approach and would escalate from there if compliance isn't achieved. Any further um, comments, Councillor Toppelberg? Just further to that, um, has, the app, has the application been submitted on the basis of compliance action that was taken, or has the app, so have we already contacted the applicant to inform them that we're aware that it's been operating without approval? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, there was no, there was a complaint, a general complaint received that identified upwards of. Uh, 10 or 12 various facilities throughout the district. It wasn't a complaint from the local area based on the many impact. That notwithstanding, uh, once the applicant um, made the application for development approval, it was on the basis that the use had already commenced with that, that approval and on that basis uh, the applicant paid the, the fee in triplicate as provided for by the regulations. So in terms of the procedure that has been followed to this point, it has been on the basis that the use commenced without development approval. I guess further to Councillor Harley's question, in the event that the application was refused and the applicant is informed that it's been refused, if it continues to operate as short-term accommodation, is the first step then to start from scratch and send a letter and say, hello, we believe you're operating a short-term accommodation and does the compliance action commence on the basis that it's come to our attention or does the compliance action on the basis that they're operating contrary to their planning refusal, which was explicitly, uh, expli would have in that instance been explicitly, well, that decision has been made and passed on. Through you, Mayor Cole, the advice the city's received is that the applicant has, in the intervening period between lodging the application and now, found a tenant. That's the, the advice we've received. That notwithstanding, if the application is refused tonight, compliance action would occur proactively because it's a, a matter before council. Uh, on the basis that compliance action has commenced in some form previously, it would probably be a case that we would not be as patient as normal in terms of escalating the compliance action. 
councillors, any further comments or questions? Sorry, Mayor, just one more question, and I apologise, this question may um, have arisen, or the comments may have arisen um, through the public gallery, and I was late um, for part of that question time. Can I ask whether there have been, and maybe this is on, um, you could take this on notice, have there been any other complaints about this property prior to this application coming in? Perhaps I can just leave that with the administration to review whether there's been other complaints come in. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, based on the various questions from last week's briefing session, uh, staff contacted police um, and they advised there was no complaints that had been received in the last four years. Uh, we also, at the request of councillors, contacted the property manager who advised that uh, they had not received any complaints either. So the complaint that was originally received to prompt this application was received uh, as part of a broader suite of complaints regarding uh, Airbnbs in the area generally. Councillors, anything further? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour of the officer recommendation to approve the short-term accommodation? All those against? I declare it lost. Uh, is there an alternate? Councillor Susan Gondoszewski moving. Seconded, Councillor Harley. I decide to move the amendment on the purple. Um, look, I think, as a general principle, I think short-term accommodation might be a type of unlisted use that we could potentially be consistent with the residential zone, and that's why we go out and we advertise and we seek public comment and we, you know, take on board a number of, and a range of opinions. So, um, and so when I considered the requested change of use in the context of the surrounding residential area and considering the responses to the consultation undertaken, including the residents that spoke in the chamber tonight and last week, uh, I do not believe that the operation of a short-term use in this particular area in the manner in which it has been proposed is compatible nor complementary to the residential development of this heritage area that is a place of special significance and which has limited off-street parking, modest lot sizes, common walls and, let's face it, probably a limited ability on the basis of the heritage status to design out the impacts of the proposed use, particularly in light of a demonstrated lack of compliance on behalf of the, behalf of the operator. A quick look around Google reveals that the applicant is continuing to run the running a short-term accommodation. There is absolutely no reference to no parties on the website. Um, and so um, uh, I, I would hope that um, we can refuse this um, application tonight. Um, it, this is not necessarily something against short-term accommodation in the residential zone as a general principle, but it is, relates to the commentary that we've received, the impact on a re amenity for surrounding residents and um, my absolute um, lack of faith that the management plan as proposed would have any ability to minimise the impact of um, uh, this sort of uh, proposed use on surrounding residents. Thank you, Councillor Gondoszewski. Um, the seconder was Councillor Harley. Sorry, apologies. Um, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, um, just a couple of brief comments. I also, um, in principle, I'm not um, opposed either to appropriate short-term residential um, being set up in the City of Vincent. We know we already have a lot of it. Um, we have some significant tourist um, areas. We're close to the city. We have a lot to offer, um, and short-term accommodation is part and parcel of a mixed of a mixed economy, but it does need to be appropriate. It does need to be. Um, it does need to be accommodation that doesn't affect people's amenity. And on this occasion, I did feel that this was going to affect the amenity. Um, as a council, we will need to. Um, I know we've got some existing policies, but this is a, a significant um, pressure that is on us as, as a city at the moment, um, and obviously our neighbouring cities as well. The um, Australian Hotels Association has just recently um, increased some of the um, pressure on state government looking for more regulation, more laws around this, and we know that in a, um, in a more highly legislated or regulated environment, more non-compliance comes in as well as people find ways of getting around those rules. So it's an ongoing challenge for us, um, but um, I do support the alternative recommendation. I think it's a good outcome for this street and this, and this zone. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Any further comments in relation to the alternate motion? Okay, look, I'll just um, add a two-second comment to say I, I wholeheartedly agree with the comments already made by Councillor Gondoszewski and Councillor Harley, and I won't repeat. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour? 
I declare it carried. Thank you. Thank you to all the Moyer Street residents who came in this evening. The next item raised was item 9.1, which is number 14, Orange Avenue, Perth, second storey addition and alterations to a group dwelling. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Gonshevsky. Um, for my benefit, and I wasn't here last week, and I apologise, so just ask a question through you to the director. Can you explain to me what, given the reasons that the council gave for not supporting this development when it came last time, can you tell me <coughs> explicitly, other and let's leave the landscaping changes, well, the palm tree in the front, the, the property. Can you tell me ex explicitly what has actually changed between the two development applications before us, please? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, putting the landscaping aside, um, there were minor modifications to the colours materials um, and the combination of the, the cladding and the colour palette, but I suppose more fundamentally the building height reduced from 7.2 metres to 7 metres, which means it now is compliant with the built form policy as it relates to building height and has the effect of reducing the variation for the side setback ever so slightly. So only very modest changes in the scheme of things, but actually brings it closer to a level of compliance. And so just so effectively, uh the, the non-compliance, so an understanding that the one metre uh, non-compliance that exists for a portion of the wall on the ground floor, uh, which relates to the, um, the section for the, for the outdoor shower, is that, that's the, so the southern setback variation relates primarily to that section of wall, which is 1.02 metres in length, is that correct? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the variation doesn't apply to the outdoor shower. That's because of the, the fact that it doesn't in, uh, entail any major openings. It gets determined based on its length of wall, and the outdoor shower is compliant. Sorry, it's th so it's the 3.8 to uh, to the addition to the rear, is that correct? Okay. Uh, and obviously and there's the uh, 600 mil set setback variation along the... Um, parapet wall to the property to the north. Um, thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll listen to the debate. Thank you. Councillor Kondrzewski. Has, forgive me on this, but um, has any um, advice, design advice been sought on the um, level one um, design in given that discretion is being sought in relation to setback and through design review panel or otherwise? Through you, Mayor Cole, the application was not referred to the, to the DRP. Um, is there capacity within our policy for deferral on the basis of refer, like requiring a referral to DRP or um, I I'm going to struggle to put my hand up to this. So, Director, would you like the Director to answer the question in relation to are we able to compulsory um, impose upon the applicant to take this through the design review panel? Um, is there a possibility to defer and require the applicant to take this to the, our design review panel for assessment and advice? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the DRP forms part of our assessment process and it would be 
open to council to defer the matter uh, to require further assessment of the proposal, which could include obviously being referred uh, specifically to the DRP. Can I ask another question? Given that this is um, a new development application, um, I just want to check the date and where we are at in terms of the statutory time frame. If you can help me out, I'm looking 2nd of August. Okay. So 2nd of August, we don't, it's not like we have the luxury of time, but it's um, still, <laughs> still an option for Council to consider. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, the application was submitted on the, on the 2nd of August. Uh, generally allowing 90 days takes us to early November. Uh, if the application was deferred for representation to the November round of meetings, it would be a, a slight departure from the 90 day time frame. So just to recap, if, if it was deferred and um, re referred to the DERP, it would come to the November meeting and there would just be a slight delay in relation to meeting that 90 day time frame. Councillor Gonczewski, do you wish to speak further? I struggled with this one throughout all its varying iterations. And I, and then I guess in some way I wish that I was seeing iterations. I feel what I'm seeing is this design is we're being chipped away to bring it closer and closer and closer to compliance. And I kind of wish I'd never seen it at all because then I wouldn't have to have anything to do with it. Now, I think the thing is, is that I don't really talk about design very often, but I think what has been said in this chamber is that the design as proposed will have a negative impact on the streetscape. This is a relatively intact single residential low density dwelling streetscape and this is a there is no articulation it is a uh, uh, anyway look I said it before I said it last time so I'm not going to say it again um, I will listen to the rest of the debate and decide whether I can put my hand in the air for this knowing that should we refuse it and it goes to south I believe that it will get approved because the variation is so minor but um, I just don't know if I can do it so that's all from me for now Councillors, Councillor Fatakis. Um, echo Councillor Gondoshevsky, but I, I was so disappointed to see this come back to us with absolute minimal changes when um, I think the whole process really was to, to try and actually get a better outcome um, that is presented for us. And now I really feel like um, we've been backs up against the wall. I mean, I don't think that we um, have, you know, um, like uh, I know with my fellow councillors, um, I've angst over this. This has probably been the application that I've, I've given the most thought um, um, all week. Um, so, I mean, I'd like to listen to um, the comments from uh, from my fellow councillors, but I'm I'm not happy with uh, what's being presented in front of me. I don't think it's a great outcome for the for the street, and there was a real opportunity um, for um, the owner to actually propose um, something that actually was uh, took on board some of the comments from uh, the previous presentation. Um, I don't really think in, in terms of that there's not been really been much um, change um, in this application. I don't really um, see referral through to DRP as really producing much of an outcome either. Um, I don't have much faith in that, not from our DRP, but from the applicant. Councillors? I'm going to move a deferral. Yes, thank you. To allow yes. the applicant to pursue a design outcome that is respectful and sensitive to the existing streetscape and character of Orange Avenue. Can I have a second? Oh, it's a race to second. No, I think Susan, Councillor Gondoshevsky, I'm giving the, this to you. Seconded by Councillor Gondoshevsky. Can I? This is no debate on a procedural motion. Should All those in favour of deferral who refer to the DRP. Sorry wasn't to refer to the DRP. No. Repeat, it was please. to allow the applicant to pursue a design outcome that is respectful and uh, sensitive to the existing streetscape and character of Orange Avenue. Um, and I'll take from that that administration will encourage um, and offer the assistance of the design review panel in meeting that objective. <laughs> Can I um, please have hands in the air for those who support the deferral? Thank you, that's carried. So that will be back for um, the November meeting.
Next we go to item 9.3, which is number 5 of 216 Stirling Street, Perth, amendment to approval for change of use from office to shop. Uh, can I have a mover for this item, please? Moved Councillor Murphy, seconded Councillor Hallett. Uh, thank you. Yeah, look, I'm supportive of uh, this application. Um, I do um, support the comments tonight and last week from the applicant around encouraging alternative transport to um, the city, uh, given that it's uh, close proximity to bike lanes um, and city we prepared an amendment um, which talks to uh, encouraging some bicycle bays. I do note that the um, applicant did mention um, that there is potentially bike facilities around the back. I'm not sure where I sit on that just yet, but um, I'll foreshadow putting an amendment forward. Um, but listen to it. comments. Councillor Hallett, do you wish to speak to the motion? Uh, councillors, Councillor Gonczewski. May I just confirm through you to the Acting Director of Development Services that if we were to do a hypothetical for this development and it was an office at the scale and size that, it, that is currently proposed, that it would um, require two car baits under our current parking table calculation? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes. Uh, if we were to assess the office land use under the current policy setting, it would require 1.6 bays, which would be rounded up to two. That's correct. And just the, the, we don't have any data on what, whether there was a... I, can't, I think I asked this last week, so I'm really sorry. Whether there was a previously approved parking shortfall under a previous assessment for this development. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, there was a very modest uh, 0.6 bay variation across the whole site. So in terms of this tenancy specifically, it uh, equates to 0 0.08 bays uh, variation. I'm supportive of this application. I'm supportive of the change of use in this area. I don't actually think this is something that council should be hindering. I think that um, this will benefit surrounding residents. Um, I've been to the site. Parking is not an issue. I drive down the street every day. There is paid parking there. There is limited, time-limited parking bays. That site is reasonably developed. I think that the parking in the surrounding areas is probably sufficient to cater for the needs of the development for the life of the development. So should Councillor Murphy put forward his recommended alternative, I would be supportive of it. And I'd also probably consider going further, but I'll listen to the debate on that one too. Uh, does anyone wish to move an amendment? Yep, happy to. That Thank was you, quick, Councillor great. Murphy. Is there Fantastic. a seconder for the amendment on the yellow? <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Gondoszewski. We're now debating the amendment. Um, Thank you for that synopsis, Councillor Gonoszewski. Um, so my amendment um, just covers simply bringing down the shortfall from 2.2 .2 to one parking bay. Um, as per the request, obviously, um, it is a hairdresser. I understand that is the proposed use. Um, that may not be forever. <clears throat> um, so I have added here um, well, we have added here, the administration actually added it, a uh, minimum of two short-term bicycle bays in re reflecting the intended use, which is to encourage um, alternate transport to the um, proposed development. Um, I did note that um, there is uh, some bike, p potentially provision of some bike um, uh, facility around the back. Um, however, it is only a cost of three hundred dollars per um, bicycle bay, so it's a cost of additional cost, of potential cost of six hundred dollars to the applicant um, to put in two short-term bicycle bays. Um, I don't feel that's unreasonable, um, but would be open if um, Councillor <laughs> Gondosiewski wanted to um, take it further. Um, but I will propose um, the amendment as it is written on um, your yellow sheet. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, that was seconded by Councillor Gonshevsky. Yep. Um, can I just ask a question in relation to the cost of the bike? It says one class three bicycle rack provides the two bicycle bays. So would the cost be $300 or $600? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, it would be $300. There you go, $300. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, I do note that I think Councillor Murphy has one of the rare hairstyles that is suitable for riding in a bike helmet after visiting the hairdresser. Um, you know, just, I just want to make a couple of comments. Uh, so um, Lorraine, who was representing the applicant uh, from the gallery, did speak about how our parking should be considered as a rough guide. Um, we've gone to quite great lengths to make sure that it is not that. And if you take the office example that was provided, a 10-person office with one car bay means nine people know day in, day out they cannot drive to work because there is no car parking for them or they have to park somewhere in a paid parking or public facility. A, um, a shop that is servicing 10 people a day, two staff and one other staff member, has people coming and going all day, which does place uh, a different type of pressure on, on the car parking. So I do think that that... that perceived an anomaly that the office use is whilst it will generally carry more people because they will generally be uh, there consistently and understand the parking uh, availability of the site and in the area. It is a, it is a different calculation for that reason. Um, look, I, I, uh, I will support the amendment. I do note that uh, the comments that we make that, uh, that there are bicycle bays, there is provision of paid parking in the area, etc. Traditionally, uh, that is funded from cash in lieu of car parking for that very reason. We provide those services because people who don't provide the parking themselves pay us money in lieu of that for which we then go and create that infrastructure. Uh, and yes, over time where there's paid car parking, that there is some revenue that can go to covering those costs. But the whole principle of time parking, ranges, monitoring, etc., is that that is funded from cash in lieu. So I do think it's a little bit ironic that we're saying because it's so well serviced in the area with this fantastic parking facility that the city has provided, we do so through the provision of cash in lieu largely. That's the principle of it. Um, but in, in this circumstance, uh, I will um, support the amendment. Councillors, any further comments? Councillor um, Harley? Um, my question is, um, and I've, I've heard all the comments, I am curious as to who is going to ride the bike to the hairdressing salon and who's going to ride at home, but there you go. Um, I, I guess my query is what good are the bicycle racks at the back of the property and wouldn't, if we're going to require them, could we not ask um, that given that if this amendment gets up, it's a significant um, decrease in the cash and loo that would have had to been paid, could the bike racks actually not be provided? Um, out the front of the property or, you know, a contribution towards providing them on actually public property. I'm just, I totally support the principle of requiring people to have the bicycle bays. I guess my question is, is it a, is it a token effort and is actually anyone going to use them or could we compromise and say actually can we put them in a place where somebody may use them and they may not be customers, they may be customers, they may be staff, they could be somebody going into a nearby business. So just just a thought. I'm pretty flexible on it. I support the amendment, though. Can I just ask a question in relation to that to the director? Um, 4.2 talks about being the provision of cycle racks um, in a location directly adjacent to number five of 216. Can you do? You, does that was the intent for it to be out the front of the hairdressing salon? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, yeah, the way the uh, the condition is drafted is to effectively speak to uh, Councillor Harley's comments about allowing them to be in the public realm in near vicinity to the subject site but accessible by the broader community. And you feel that 4.2 is enough, provides enough clarity for that to be in the public realm? Okay. Further comments or questions? Okay, I'm going to put the amendment. All those in favour? Declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Is there any further comment or question? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare the motion carried. Uh, the next item that was raised from the public gallery was item 12.2, which is the Kyala Community Farmers Market permit approval and waiver of fees, and this is an absolute majority decision. Can I please have a mover and seconder? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Hallett. 
Um, I'll be brief. Uh, uh, the Kyla Markets is a great uh, asset in our community. I think it's something we should be supporting, and I'm very happy to support the officer recommendation. Councillor Hallett. Ditto. <laughs> Further comments? Oh, look, I can't help myself. I just, I'm sorry. I know we we're on to something here, but you can't let this pass without saying the Kayla Farmers Market is a great success story in the city of Vincent. We've seen farmers markets come and go. This has got the exact right ingredients for success. It's community driven. It's you know allocated. Its its location is in the heart of a community. It has people that come every single week. It's a gathering place. It's driven from that real sense of community spirit, and I think that is the the secret of its success and I'm so proud and happy to support it and to be able to give the market a five-year approval knowing that they will be able to survive and they'll be there in five years time for a community farmers market that's no mean feat so I'd just like to say congratulations Kayala and to the farmers market committee um, well done it's a real pleasure to support you any further comments Councillor Fatakas is starting now um, you did miss out on the bacon and egg wrap, so I just want to add that uh, to one of the valuable uh, additions on a Saturday morning. Yeah. Thank you so much. That goes without saying yes. Um, Can I put a plug in for the veggies? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> now we're going to get into the vegan discussion. Okay, I better put the motion unless there's anything really pressing. Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Okay, the next item is 10.1, which is the proposed 40 kilometre an hour uh, area-wide speed zone trial, results of consultation. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Lowden, seconded Councillor Hallett. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I fully support the, the 40k per hour speed zone. Um, I do note the comments around the suggestion that we should have actually gone further and gone to 30 k's an hour. I'd love to see us go to 30 k's an hour at some point in the future, but this is not a case of you can just change things overnight. You need to allow the community time to adjust to these ideas, um, and 40 k's an hour is a good step in the right direction. Um, as a kid, uh, we used to visit my family in Canada, and um, every second house had a basketball hoop faced out to the road, and we always used to go out and play basketball with my cousins. All the other kids would come out and play as well. Um, and the idea that we could start to see things like that happening in our local streets, building our communities, bringing speeds down, improving safety is going to be fantastic. So I'm really excited to see what will come, <coughs> come out of this trial. Cheers. Thank you, Councillor Lowden. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Happy to support um, this motion. Similar to um, Councillor Lowden. Um, I'd also like to see us move to a 30k at some point, but I, I do think that we need to... Um, be cognizant of the community feedback was not in majority favour of a 30k because that was asked in the community consultation. Um, 40k is still contentious. The consultation was close, and I think we need to be, um, I guess, aware of the resistance that some people might have around um, what is ultimately a small change. Um, but once it's there, I think you know we we tend to be quite laid back about change after it's happened. So um, I'm looking forward to it being rolled out. Um, seeing hopefully I guess a change of discussion and, and um, culture around slower streets and what streets can be beyond um, conduits for cars and um, as well as increasing road safety and just a comment around I guess the, the idea of perception of speed versus reality of speed um, I, I don't want to discount perception of speed because that's exactly um, one of the things that we want to address and it's if streets are not perceived to be safe um, and perceived to be slow enough to send your kids out to play on the verges um, etc then um, that will stop people connecting and socialising and um, using the streets for those alternative purposes so um, perception is important and I'm very happy to support this. Councillors, Councillor Gonshevsky. I'd just like to move the amendment on the lilac. Seconded, I think, by Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. I'm supportive of the um, overall recommendation. I just think that this um, perhaps uh, talks about um, the 
research that is going to undertake. One of the reasons you might undertake a trial is to gather some really meaningful in-context, in-area data, and I think that's... Um, so I'm very pleased to see um, this um, amendment in relation to 1.2, um, and because I think we do need to recognise that, um, whilst perhaps not groundbreaking enough for some, this is new for the um, metropolitan area, and we do want to ensure that what we, the data we gather, is able to be transferred out across Vincent potentially, perhaps, and uh, broader across Perth. So, um, yes, just that amendment there. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, yeah, look, I, I think uh, this, whilst it would happen anyway, I think it's important to note it. I think that it's uh, perhaps critically important for um, some people who like to stand in the gallery and throw pot shots about proper analysis and doing our homework and liaising with the correct departments, etc. I think one of the privileges of uh, being a retired elected member is that uh, you don't have people necessarily ringing you and providing with their opposing views to things that are before council. Uh, I know that uh, I've received uh, many phone calls and been stopped uh, in the aisle at Coles and uh, been accused of nanny statism and those sorts of things in relation to this. So there is a divergence of views and I find it wholly, uh, whilst I'm not specifically talking to the amendment, uh, wholly bizarre that the idea that uh, moving to a 40 kilometre an hour trial in an area where you've asked during the consultation process whether 30 kilometres would be considered somehow stands in the way of more progressive councils who may wish to pursue a 30 kilometre an hour trial. I mean, what a... Anyway, um, so look, I, uh, I will talk to the substantive in a moment, but I think in terms of the amendment, I think that this just highlights to our community and to our stakeholders that uh, this isn't a decision that's been taken lightly. It's been uh, looked at at a national level. Uh, and it is something that we are championing, and uh, and yeah, I think that it's uh, it, it, there's no question it's been contentious. But I, I, in terms of the amendment, uh, it does provide that framework, but also that obligation in line with the offer from the Office of Road Safety uh, to ensure that that does actually happen. Councillors, well, given I put it up, I should just make a few comments. Um, look, I just felt that it was really important to give a fuller picture. Um, in the recommendation because I think that the motion itself is an important statement and um, it just really, from my perspective, is important to demonstrate that this isn't just something that we've plucked out of the sky, it's something that we've actually been discussing for two years and that we have been working closely with the Office of Road Safety who supports the trial. Currently, we're the only council um, the state government isn't making this move, but we are the only council that's putting our hand up to do this body of work, and that is why the Office of Road Safety are supporting us and um, offering to fund um, re research so that this will be an evidence-based trial. And I think that um, it's important to demonstrate that we have the support of the Office of Road Safety and that we are treating this um, as a proper trial, evidence-based, that we're looking at having a working group. We're trying to draw in all of those road safety stakeholders that have a role to play. We know that things like enforcement of um, of, of speeds are so important. We will be trying to get Waypol onto um, WA Police onto this um, reference group and that we are actually wanting to demonstrate within the City of Vincent an inner city community on the doorstep of the City of Perth that um, you know we are prepared to take this step and that we are prepared for and and seeking that input and that commitment from other stakeholders who are so such important voices in this discussion and debate going forward. Any further comment, Councillor Harley? Um, yes, through you and uh, through me, I wholeheartedly um, support your comments. Um, I won't make comment about what was said in the um, public public gallery, but I actually think this is pushing the envelope um, in a way that. Vincent are well known for. I think other councils will want to talk to us about what we've done. I think this actually completely opens the door for other councils to progressively move in this direction. Without a doubt, I think other councils will thank us for actually having, um, you know, done this uh, this process in such a um, a robust way. And I think it's a um, it's a testament to the council, to the administration, that um, we are being. A, a, working in a collaborative way with those other agencies and those stakeholders. So 
Um, I think it's really exciting. I've just recently moved to a residential street, um, so speed is an issue for me now too. It was before, but actually it really, really is. You see it once you walk around the streets that the, the streets where the cars are going up faster, people just are not on them. And you go to another street and there's kids, you know, like literally kicking balls across the street. It makes a massive difference. And it is perception absolutely um, is important. And I think that, um, you know, that is something we need to be and we need to be very aware of. So I think it's well done to everyone who's been involved with this and I really look forward to the outcomes and I look forward to seeing streets with 40 kilometres and maybe we will see streets with 30 kilometres if there's a group of residents who are willing to go down um, that journey with us. I'm, I'm sure that this council would be very progressive in blazing the path in that as well. Thank you, Councillor Harley. Any further comments in relation to the amendment? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Toppelberg. Just very briefly, um, over the couple of years we have been talking about this, I've had some issues with it in principle, uh, not just in terms of the speed itself, but in terms of the cost involved. And for me, the tipping point was conversations uh, as part of my proper analysis and homework, um, conversations uh, with community and with our own with our engineering. And if you look at the report, page 253, and look at the response from people who had concerns about the trial. 14 people uh, who responded saying that they would prefer speed humps and traffic calming to be installed, and the number one uh, item which residents ranked as measures to improve safety was speed humps and other traffic calming measures. I hate speed humps with a passion. And if I look at the cost of installing them, and you just look at if we were to satisfy, and if you look at the uh, uh, the prevalence of uh, speed humps, particularly through uh, some of the northern parts of North Perth, and some of those streets between Charles and Walcott, and some of the way in which Vincent has responded to traffic calming and to avoiding rat runs, uh, not through speed management, but effectively through uh, making it more difficult to drive down some of these streets. Uh, the cost alone uh, over the period of the, of the period of the trial, uh, were we to go down the path of responding in the way that we have over the last six or seven years to requests for traffic calming and speed humps, our cost would actually be far greater to get the speed down to that level. So for me, there is actually a, an immediate cost benefit in not having to spend uh, to spend those funds. There's no doubt that there are other traffic calming measures, and I know that we are working together with our UMAG, bingo, uh, to be able to uh, introduce some of those in, into, uh, into common practice at Vincent. But for me, I guess that was the tipping point, which happened some time ago, but uh, certainly arriving at a decision to support the trial has not... Uh, uh, it wasn't a poll of the response to the feedback. I think that that's, a, that's sometimes a poor measure. I think that, as I said, I've had people uh, contacting me, uh, which is relatively unusual in relation to some of these things, but who've been vehemently opposed to it, uh, and others on the uh, the pro side of the fence. But uh, I think it's uh, ultimately the uh, it's there as a trial, and I, with the support of the analysis that will come uh, from uh, a uh, from a proper university analysis of uh, of the trial and its impact, I think that we, as Councillor Gontoshevsky said, will have uh, significant data to progress forward. Would have been nice to have had the state government's further support and uh, either to lessen the cost or to be able to roll it out, uh, perhaps uh, across all of Vincent. Uh, and I also do note that uh, I did speak to the director of engineering earlier in the week in relation to um, what happens with fined revenue, because uh, we don't want to become a hangout for people people in uniform hiding behind trees with radars to be able to catch people. Whilst we want to make sure there is compliance, we want to be sure that uh, the streets aren't targeted by police as a revenue raising exercise. And um, yeah, that's something that we can work closely, uh, perhaps through Safer Vincent or otherwise, with, uh, uh, with our liaisons with the local police. But I will support the trial. Councillors. Um, just a few additional comments. Um, I just want to say, and sorry, Councillor Loden, <laughs> you're looking for a fast meeting, but you know, I've been away for a month, I've got a few things to say. Um, I just want to say that one of the things that has concerned me over time, and it's been a growing concern, is that people will come to me and say, please put out the, the black strips on the road, there's speeding on my street, this is really making our street just you know, impossible in terms of a, a sort of safe perspective, in terms of kids living on the street, etc., um, and then when you put out the classifiers and you collect the data, it will often show that the speeds are around 50 kilometres an hour. So, the, and 
the residents will often question that. Some will go as far as requesting more data and wanting to really sort of, um, you know, push um, their, their, you know, interrogation of the data, just having some concerns that perhaps it's not true. And what it really leads to is just that, that understanding that what people are saying is that 50 is too fast on our residential streets. And I think it was really ex in, um, that when you actually looked at what the top concerns were that were listed, it wasn't really, it wasn't about, um, you know, accidents, it was about safer streets for all road users. So it's about a recognition that there are pedestrians, there are cyclists, there are kids walking to school that are using the streets, there are elderly people that need to be able to cross. Um, and that the second most um, important concern was to enhance the neighbourhood feel of the streets. And I think that's really critical. Um, I think the European experience is fantastic. I had the pleasure of staying in the first London borough to introduce 30 kilometre zones in London. The Mayor, Sadiq Khan, has just re um, introduced a 30 kilometre limit on um, transport for London corridor streets within the City of London. There's a push in other, in other um, boroughs in London to do this. It works really well. Um, London is a very big city. Similarly, this is happening in Dublin where I visited, where they're going beyond the immediate town centre to looking at outer, um, outer areas of their, of their city, estates, which is residential areas, and also in Madrid where they had um, stayed in a, in a borough where there were 30 kilometre zones and it obviously um, helped a lot in terms of pedestrian safety. There was cycle lanes on these streets. Um, it was the ability to cross the streets was certainly a lot easier in this um, situation. But I think Councillor Hallett has really nailed the issue here is that we're not London, we're not Madrid, um, we're not Dublin. We're starting on this journey. We're Perth, Western Australia. And when you look at the results, while the results were more... Um, in favour and endorsing, then you know UK has actually decided to exit the European Union on a smaller margin. 57% is actually pretty good. But when you look at the support for the 30 kilometre um, speed limit, that was 16%. So I think that we are progressive, but we're also very pragmatic and we understand our community. We talk to our community members. We understand that there's divergent views about this and that this is not an easy argument to win. That is why, you know, this hasn't been done before. And that is why the Office of Road Safety is prepared to back us on a 40 kilometre zone in Perth, because they understand the environment that we're working within. And I think that's a testament to our council that we're in touch with, um, with our residents and our community. So, you know, while there are those of us around the table that see absolute benefits of 30 kilometres an hour, I admire our pragmatism and I think it is good that we're able to take this stepped approach and know you know, how to sort of take take this journey forward. So I'm really happy with the results and I'm happy to have that 50% support for this in this phase and um, look forward to working with the Office of Road Safety and other road safety um, stakeholders on this trial. Councillor Harley. Through you, Mayor. Sorry, I just have a um, comment on, um, on the substantive. <clears throat> and it is, um, I'm not putting my black hat on, I'm just making an observation uh, which I think we need to be mindful of and have a... Um, a mechanism for the adjacent street which runs to the north of Vincent Street. Just for the record, I live one street over. I do not live on the adjacent street um, to Vincent Street, but having walked around that area and I've chatted, um, getting to know my neighbours, they tell me on both those streets more cars increased once we put the speed bumps on Vincent Street. They run, they basically rat running. Um, for want of a better term, from Fitzgerald Street um, and often people will go up the adjacent street, I can't remember the name, and they won't turn left, they'll be turning right, so they just as easily could have gone down Vincent Street and there was a noticeable difference. So I guess um, it might be important, I think, um, as a suggestion to ensure that the adjacent road to Vincent Street, which may feel an immediate um, change to the traffic, has a mechanism where they can actually let the administration know if they see any differences, only because we know that where uh, these traffic calming measures go in, it's quite often the problem has actually just moved down um, a street or two. So, Would you like the director to respond to that, Councillor Harley? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, thank you, Councillor Harley. That's good advice. And uh, we'll certainly take that into account with the project. So... Um, Probably the best way is that I raise it with the um, project team when we get going, that that's a potential 
negative impact and we'll work out a mechanism that residents can contact us and we can measure that effect too. Any further comments in relation to the substantive motion? Okay, I'll put it. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Okay, the last item raised by a member of the public gallery is item 13.1, which is... Oh, this is my second page. <laughs> 13.1, uh, adoption of the City of Vincent Strategic Plan, Community Plan 2018 to 2028, and this is an absolute majority decision. Can I have a mover, please, and a seconder? Moved, Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded, Councillor Murphy. Yay, I'm really happy with this. I feel that we have uh, run a great process. I'm happy with the final document. I'm already using it in the way that I consider, you know, um, the items that are coming before me in, the, in um, you know, in terms of linking of how we're going to um, make this document, I guess, I don't know, sing or, you know, uh, live within our um, decision making, within our processes and within the way that we run, that the city runs its um, operational business. Um, I'm very happy um, that we are now moving to the next phase of our strategic community plan and um, I thank you to everybody involved and I hope that um, we have learnt a lot of lessons in um, how to engage with our community in a variety of ways to elicit really meaningful data that we are then able to um, uh, sort through, sift through, not lose anything, but really distill into a document that is practical and going to allow um, it to be something that is useful to the city and integral to us in the way that um, the city um, uh, conducts its business over the next 10 years. Ditto those comments. Um, obviously we've talked on this a few times now, so um, really just looking forward to getting on with it. Well done. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Any further comments? Um, I'm just, yes, Councillor Fatakis. Um, I just want to say that I love it when I hear the community quote from our strategic community plan. So a year ago, um, involved, to go from involved with the Imagine Vincent to seeing this document come to f um, the form that it is now and then moving on to other documents, um, say for Vincent Plan, that it becomes so much easier when you've got a quality do document like this which is underpinned by um, such a fantastic consultation process. But um, please, uh, to the community, keep quoting it because I love hearing p uh, the community actually use this document. I want to see it used not just by us on council but by the community as well. Thank you, Councillor Fatakis. Any further comments? I just want to say hooray and I would like to thank all of the community members that took part in this process. Um, it, was, um, it was a pretty joyful experience and um, after the, the consultation period, which was intensive and roving and went all over, Vincent ended, it was, um, <laughs> it was a bit sad because um, <laughs> it was nice to really have that intensive um, contact with all of our community members over this and there was many... Um, enjoyable evenings and, and time spent. So, um, and thank you also to the staff um, for um, yeah for bringing it together and our consultant space um, shape urban. I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. I now we now go back through the agenda sequentially for the items that have not yet been dealt with. So that brings us to item 9.3, 5, oh no, sorry, we've done that one. 9.6, 162 Oxford Street, Leaderville, amendment to approval for hours of operation and patron numbers for small bars. Can I have a mover and seconder? Moved, Councillor Gondoshevsky, seconded, Councillor Loden. Um, supportive, but I'd like to move the amendment on the, I don't know, green, tealy sort of colour. Um, Councillor Loden, are you happy to support that? Thank you. Uh, fairly self-explanatory. I believe the applicant has been contacted in relation to um, bringing their hours of operation in line with what we've given in 
similar applications. Councillor Loden, any further comment? I'll put the amendment. All those in favour? Back to the substantive. Any further comment or question? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Declare it carried. Okay, item 9.7, 559 Beaufort Street, Mount Lawley, change of use from shop to unlisted use small bar, amendment to approved conditions. Councillor Gondoshevsky is moving, Councillor Loden seconding. Any comments, Councillor Gondoshevsky, Councillor Loden, councillors? Okay, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Um, that takes us to item 9.9. .9. This was brought forward because there is a financial interest of accounts. Councillor Murphy, do you wish to vacate the chamber? Thank you. Uh, this is item 9.9, .9, relocation of the Leadable Town Centre Taxi Zone. Can I have a mover and seconder, please? Moved Councillor Loden, seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Uh, just simply to say that I'm happy with the uh, the relocation that's proposed and support the officer recommendation. Councillor Toppelberg. I, yeah, this is, in my opinion, long overdue. Happy that it's come about, but I think it's uh, a part of us reclaiming that centre of Leadable, which I made reference to when the motion first came to Council. Councillors, Councillor Gondoshevsky. This is just in relation to the alfresco, just to... Um, I believe that there is an existing permit to, for the outdoor eating area uh, that's valid until oh today. Um, so I guess I just wanted to check in terms of the commentary around the approval being undertaken with existing delegations. If the um, alfresco area was ever to be expanded or request was received to expand the Alfresco area, would that be something that would come to council or would that be something that would be dealt with under delegated authority? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, if it's okay, I'd uh, appreciate being able to take that one notice and uh, report back. Can yeah, I'd, I'd appreciate the report back because that may... I mean, I, I'm supportive of this, that's fine, but it may be something that I want to consider in relation to reviewing delegations, in, particularly in light of what we're going to consider or have considered on block. I'm not sure in terms of the shared space. No, the shared space is an absolute majority of decisions so hasn't been considered yet. Councillors, um, I just did want to raise with you, I had raise the con slight concern about the location of the pick up and set down bay adjacent to the IGA in that um, right of way that enters off um, Vincent Street and the director did provide a bit of information about it being under a light but then the bay closer to the Vincent Street um, end has actually got a CCTV camera um, but I just want to ask the director is the CCTV camera private property or is that one of the CCTV cameras that the City of Vincent um, has access to? Uh, through you Mayor Cole, I'm not aware who operates and who owns the camera or only to say that it's mounted to private property being the IGA building. So look, I'm, it is apparently well lit. Um, I just, I don't know if it's sort of you know, these, sometimes these council resolutions are so specific that the council administration will then say, well, it has to be this bay because that's what it says in the report. But, I mean, I guess I would like there to be a bit more flexibility if it was found that the bay closer to the street was safer. And you, particularly if you're calling an Uber and you're walking to it, there's not many open access points through the um, businesses at that time of night. So you will literally be walking down Vincent Street and into the right of way to get access. Mayor Cole, could I please get some advice on an appropriate wording for an amendment that would either allow that flexibility or would actually relocate the bay closer to Vincent Street? Director, are you able to assist with that, please? Uh, 
Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, uh, the council part one of the council or the recommendation refers to adopting the changes as shown in attachment four. Uh, it would be open to amend that to something along the lines of uh, adopting the changes shown in attachment four subject to the pick-up set-down bay located to the south of Vincent Street but the west of Oxford Street uh, to be relocated closer towards Vincent Street or something to that effect. Do you wish to move that amendment, Councillor Gondoshevsky? I do. Seconded Councillor Toppelberg. Any comments or questions? I'll just um, make sure that is the wording has the wording been captured? I'll just give um, the, Emma a moment to capture the wording. I just wanted to say that the reason that one of, I won't move this amendment. No, no. Councillor Tobberberg has just advised um, that this bay closer to Vincent Street will bring people obviously closer proximity to CCTV footage, but also perhaps will assist rangers in making sure that the bay is being used for pick up and set down only, um, as there is increased visibility um, of the bay from both Vincent and Oxford Street. Fantastic. <laughs> Good visibility makes for better safety as well. We have a form of words on the screen. Um, Con Councillor Gondoshevsky and the seconder, Councillor Topper, are you happy with the form of words? Oh, it's changed. It's now up to the Director of Engineering. I say what you've done, Director of Engineering. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Okay, are you happy with that or would you like to be explicit? You're happy with that, okay. Um, any debate on the amendment? Okay, I'll put the amendment, all those in favour. I declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Councillor Harley. Um, thank you. I have a, um, just have a question in regards to, and this is on attachment four, and it's the location just outside of the Lunar Cinema. There was some ch um, changes... Um, Suggested. Can I just clarify that this is a current pickup set down and is just remaining a pickup set down with some change of times? Through you, Mick Hole, yes, that's correct. It's, uh, it is remaining a pickup set down bay, but it is rather than being 12 hours in a 24 hour period, it will be all the time. I just, I guess I want to make a comment, not um, violently opposed to it. That is actually an incredibly dangerous pick-up and drop-off zone. I'm not, not sure if the administration has sent people down there, particularly later into the evening once the drinks are flowing. Um, I, I have seen so many near misses there um, with buses 
and with vehicles that come around, they take a left turn off Vincent Street, and I'm surprised no one's been killed in that location. Um, the pickups that are occurring are quite often occurring from people on the other side um, of the street. Uh, not necessarily saying they come from a particular bar, but I've noticed that they tend to come from the other side of the street and they bolt straight across those lights. I, I think that um, if, this, if this one is going to stay as a share ride place, I actually think we probably need to monitor it a little bit just to make sure just to make sure so these are my observations they're not technical they're not official but they're from being a regular down in Leaderville and taking time just to stop and actually watch what's what is happening um, on that corner and I would suggest that in terms of the um, vehicles that turn left off Vincent Street I've seen them go up the curb there and everything so it's more than just about the pickup drop off it's actually the um, in fact the police for a long period of time used to pick up people there speeding on a very regular basis because it goes from one speed zone and as they turn left it goes into another speed zone but quite often people are turning off Vincent Street at quite a high speed. Um, so I would um, just, my suggestion that people from the administration may want to go down and just have a bit of a look at that um, pick up um, drop off zone both during the daytime and also of an evening if there are rangers or, or people around just to be extra cautious. Um, Councillor Harley, just to let you know, um, Councillor Murphy and I and um, Acting Director um, of Community Engagement and a few other staff, there seemed to be an army of people that day, went down to the Lunar Cinema to meet with the Lunar Cinema about the use of this bay, because currently it's no parking and it's only pick up and set down in the evenings and the Luna approached the City of Vincent to say that they are having issues with seniors um, coming to movie sessions during the day, so they're very keen for it to be used as a um, pick-up and set-down bay for access during the day. Um, I think if we're starting to get queuing with um, rideshare in the evening, I understand what you're saying, that that um, could be an issue, but I think that this is, this is existing as a nighttime pick up and set down and that we are adding the daytime and that was really in response to the Lunar's concerns about having access for their, um, well, their predominantly seniors but people with mobility issues. Any further comments in relation to this item? Okay, I'll put it, all those in favour, I declare it carried. Uh, next item was called out by Councillor Toppelberg, item 9.10, amendment number two to local planning scheme number two. Oh, moving, great. Seconding, Councillor Gondoszewski. Um, I, did, I did ask the acting director earlier, just I'm, I'm perplexed that you can actually initiate a amendment to this, an amendment to the scheme without an absolute majority, but I just uh, wanted to pick it out just to note that I, I, yeah, I was not comfortable with an amendment to our planning scheme being moved on block, so that's the reason I picked it out. I um, don't have anything else to say on it, I just felt that it was something that was worthy of actually getting people's hands in the air on the item rather than uh, being passed on block. Um, it's yeah. a very good question. Should it be an, on an absolute majority decision, Director? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, um, nothing I've seen has suggested it needs to be Absolute majority, but uh, understand uh, Councillor Tolberg's comments. Councillor Gondoszewski, do you wish to speak to it? Councillors, and Carl put it, all those in favour? I declare it carried. That ends the development services items for the evening. Um, and we have dealt with both of the engineering items, so that takes us to corporate services. We have item 11.5, variation of Leaderville Tennis Club and North Perth Tennis Club leases to enable return of funds held in the city's reserve accounts to clubs. Can I have a mover? Councillor Toppelberg seconded. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. Uh, so I've pulled this out because I do want to propose an amendment, but I'm just going to ask a question first through you, Director, to the Director of Corporate Services. Just the explanation of the lease that currently exists for North Perth Tennis Club. So the North Perth Tennis Club currently occupies the tennis courts and club rooms as a monthly tenant pursuant to a holding over provision of the lease dated 7th of July 2009, and the club pays the annual rent. The club, uh, the club rooms is a brick built building, and the 
So am I of the understanding that the building which the building is the subject of the lease which is the, uh, currently on the five plus five, but the uh, the courts themselves are on a monthly tenancy, is that correct? Or does the lease cover the use of the courts and the building? Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, my understanding is it's the uh, courts and the building, um, but I, I'm going to have to confirm that. Okay, and just so it's not overly relevant to what I'm, I'm just, but I will actually ask the acting CEO uh, a question. Uh, do we know the um, presumed lifespan of a resurfaced hard court? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, yes, we did seek some advice from Tennis West, and it's between eight and ten years. Okay, so I guess my concern relates to um, uh, clause. Uh, six or proposed uh, clause six of the decision, which effectively says to North Perth Tennis Club, we know you're going to resurface the courts and that's fine, just be aware that you're paying for it. Uh, they have a lease which will uh, expire in uh, 2025, which means if they go ahead and do it, uh, they, are, uh, they have a right over the courts for a period of uh, a maximum of five years, presuming they exercise the option. Uh, whilst I don't presume anything that is going to happen thereafter, I just think it would be pertinent to include in the decision that we actually write to them and inform them that the decision to resurface the courts in no way guarantees them a longer lease over the property and further that uh, I actually think it's responsible as council that we advise them not to proceed with the resurfacing until the lease negotiations have progressed to a stage where they're sure about their future. So I don't have the exact wording but I'll perhaps seek the input of the acting CEO given that he's been a part of those negotiations with the club. Can I make an alternative suggestion that you might wish to consider is that you just delete clause six? Uh, except we know they're intending to do it and we're giving them back this money saying we know you're and we do know they're intending to do it. I just think being silent on it is potentially acknowledging here's the money and we know I just think we should be overt in saying that we don't recommend you resurface those courts until you know that you or we are going to be there long term with tennis courts. That's my personal view. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I, I think there is certainly some validity in terms of uh, Councillor Toppelberg's comments. Um, another aspect on top of the lease negotiations that could be drawn to the club's attention is the fact that, uh, as per our corporate business plan, we'll be undertaking a review of the Woodville Reserve Master Plan, um, which um, may indeed result in some changes to um, many of the community groups at the reserve. So. Um, my view would be that uh, it would be prudent to include both, um, I guess, advance notice that the club should not resurface the courts until a, a new lease has been negotiated um, and or the Woodville Reserve Master Plan review has been completed. That sounds like outstanding wording. So uh, if we could perhaps make 6.1 6 notes and leave that as is. Uh, and can, then I, can I just say if you have a seconder? I don't know what you're seconding. Oh, sorry, for the yeah, item. For the, for the amendment. I haven't got there yet. I haven't told you what the amendment would be. Oh, I thought that was what the amendment was going to be and you just agreed to it. Well, I was taking it. inspiration from. <laughs> right, OK, so you've <laughs> taken inspiration and now you're about to outline your amendment. Correct. OK. Correct, so it would be 6.1 would be... also Clause 6.1 would be notes, etc. Clause 6.2 would be advises the North Perth Tennis Club that the city does not recommend proceeding with the resurfacing of the hard courts. Uh, until uh, lease negotiations uh, and or the leadable master, uh, the Woodville Reserve Master Plan process have been completed. Can I have a second, to please, Councillor Gondoshevsky? Um, Emma, would you like Councillor Tobelberg to repeat the amendment? Yes, please repeat. Sorry, so 6.1 is notes as it is, and 6.2 advises the North Perth Tennis Club that the city would not recommend proceeding with the resurfacing of the hard courts. OK, pause. Does not, would not. Does not, rather than would not. So that advises the North Perth Tennis Club that the city does not recommend proceeding with the resurfacing of the hard courts. Until the lease negotiations and or Woodville Reserve master plan processes are complete.
uh, process rather than negotiations the second time? Yes, yeah, so negotiations the second time should be process or processes. So advises the North Perth Tennis Club that the city does not recommend proceeding with the resurfacing of the hard courts until the lease negotiations and or the Woodville Master Woodville Reserve Master Plan processes are complete. Um, so we have a mover and a second. Council Topper, do you wish to speak to the amendment? I, I, I don't, as I say, it's not presupposing any outcomes. I just think that if we are specifically giving money with the knowledge of what they're intending to spend it on, I can see a situation where we'll be here in 2022 being told we just spent $25,000 resurfacing these courts on your say so. You knew about it. Why didn't you warn us? Here's our 20 year lease proposal. Why can't we have it? And I don't know that we're ready. We're at that stage yet. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Oh, yeah, look, I note that item five of the recommendation requires that any expenditure on asset maintenance or capital works receiving prior written approval of the city. So I think that um, that is a process that would need to be gone through at any event if the resurfacing works were to occur. However, I am supportive of the amendment because I think it clarifies the issues that... that I know it says city and not council, but if I was the decision maker in that instance, and I'm not necessarily supposing that I would be, but that would be front of mind um, when making that decision on to approve um, expenditure and asset maintenance. So, yes, supportive of the recommendation. Councillors, any further comments on the amendment? OK, I'll put it. All those in favour? Back to the substantive. Any further comments or questions? I'll put it. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Okay, item 11.6, City of Vincent Statutory Review of Wards and Representation. Mover and seconder, moved Councillor Tobelberg, seconded Councillor Hallett. Thank you. So, um, and I wasn't here last week, and I, uh, so I don't know if this was raised, but I um, didn't see anything in relation to it in the uh, briefing notes. Um, can I get... Uh, my issue is... And I understand we've got a, and it had an external consultant complete the review. Um, I have an issue, I guess, with the option, the four options. I mean, obviously, no change is always an option, and no wards is always an option. So the other two options that uh, we are going to the community with is effectively a weighted balance towards the south ward, which uh, I think is something quite contentious. And the other is. Uh, excising Leaderville, which has historically, I think, had a very strong association with the South Ward representation. And I think that, that you know, I, I, have, I have an issue with the op th those being the options presented as delivering the outcome that's going to effectively be a balance of a couple of thousand electors. So can I just ask what the time frame is in, t uh, in terms of how quickly this has to go out and whether it, it's time for it to come perhaps to a workshop before we can go out again? Through you, Nicole, uh, the timeframes are quite tight um, because we're working towards the January 2019 deadline to advise the um, Local Government Advisory Board. Um, so it is due to go out to consultation by the 18th of October, um, which allows the deadline of 3rd of December to be met. So we, we don't have a lot of time. Um, just by way of explanation about the options we did deliberately choose to keep it simple because um, we looked at a few more complex options but they didn't really appear to add a lot of value and would probably expand the amount of debate without really um, uh, giving valuable options and outcomes. Right, so I guess um, me personally uh, I I am not comfortable presenting those as the... I don't think that those options reflect the, what the Vincent community and the breakup of our wards system is. Uh, I will talk broadly to it. I uh, think that the no ward option effectively invites party politics and larger scale and well-funded people to get elected because it, uh, whilst we are essentially... You know, anyone who's been through the process, where essentially our wards are completely walkable, you can pretty much do, reasonably speaking, with a small group of, very small group of people, you can walk once or twice uh, to, to leaflet drop the entire ward. Uh, 
there are people who've been elected to this council or run for council that have an army of people that uh, can comfortably cover that. But I think it does change the demographic and dynamic of uh, how people, how electable people may be within Vincent as the no ward option. I uh, think that the no, whilst the no change option is there, if you look at the development patterns and the zoning in Vincent, it's only going to increasingly become a problem. So whether we, if we ignore it now, it's going to be an issue that's going to come up again later. Uh, and for me, the cutting off or the sending of Leaderville to the North Ward, I think is actually, or that southern portion below Burke Street, I think is a significant cultural change to how people affiliate themselves with their elected members. And that's just my perception as a South Ward councillor. I don't think we, we feel that I'll see it in any decision-making environment, but there is certainly... Uh, and certainly the further south you get into those parts of Leaderville, there is an affinity, I think, in communities of likeness and land zoning and otherwise as you head more to the east rather than heading to the north. So I think that, that the options presented, other than the no change, do present a bit of an issue. But I'd be interested to hear others' comments and understanding that with the advertising period and with Christmas, we pretty much have to make a decision, perhaps by next meeting, just... Is that a question? I guess the question is, is it an option to defer? And in terms of the um, local government board's um, requirement and the, and the requirement for the ward review to happen this year, is that deadline absolute? Is it a statutory deadline? Is there flexibility? Apologies, through you, Meg Hall. Um, the deadline is probably not that strict, um, we could probably exercise a bit of latitude given it's over the Christmas period if that was the decision of council. Sorry, directly saying that deferral till next month is an option? I don't think it would cause, sorry through you, Mayor Cole, I don't think it would cause um, significant problems with the local government advisory board if we did that. So I think it would be an option. Uh, Councillor Fatakis. What would be the process then? Um, would we need to actually apply for, for an extension or um, is that a decision that we could actually make tonight? Through you, Michael, we would apply for um, an extension, but I think the decision could be made this evening. I don't expect there would be a problem getting an extension. Sorry, just in terms of the decision process in the reverse, if it was for whatever reason, refused and demanded by that date, we would need to call a special council meeting that meant that we could advertise within the appropriate time frame. But it do deferring it tonight doesn't, doesn't preclude us from meeting that deadline if there is a negative response from the Local Government Advisory Board. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. Can I just, before, if there is a, a, a procedural motion, I'm not sure whether council members wish to debate the motion um, before them first. So, Councillor Harley, I can say you wish to speak. Have you finished speaking for the time being yet, yeah, Councillor Harley? Um, I guess I just have a question about the process so I can understand the process that administration went through um, in regards to um, the options that in the options paper. So I just want an understanding of how those options came about. Through you, Mayor Cole, we worked fairly closely with the consultant who's done a significant number of similar reviews um, in this space and we did rely on his recommendations, um, partly due to the time frame but partly because of the significant experience he'd had in this space. Um, these were his preferred options uh, in terms of keeping it fairly simple um, and we then did discuss that um, as an executive group and, and again just determined that keeping it simple would have been um, the better approach in that making it more complex would extend um, the amount of debate and potentially the time that it would take us to finalise it. Um, through you Chair, um, through to you Director, sorry can I have the name of the consultant please? I've missed that, sorry. Through you Mayor Cole, it's Chris Lippisett. Chris Levisich. Okay. So what I, what I want to understand is about the um, the Leaderville or that annexing the move, moving of um, Leaderville. It's it obviously is Oxford Street runs through both um, uh, both wards. But um, I take Councillor Topperberg's point about actually surprising that there are quite different cultures um, along Oxford Street. So I just want to understand. Um, I'm just wondering. 
you've, you mentioned several times, Director, that they were his options and his preferred options. I, it actually doesn't sit that comfortably with me. Um, so these are obviously end up being our options that, as a council, we agree to put them out to public advertisement. So I just want to understand what the evidence base was, what was the framework, what was the whatever you want to call it, you know, what 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 drum, you know, drum did he um, beat to in regards to that? How did he work up this framework for Vincent um, about what are op what our options are or may be preferable to our community? Thank you, through you, Mayor Cole. Um, a lot of the discussion that we had with him was around the um, the fact that the councillors tend not to vote along ward lines um, and that it probably wasn't going to make a significant difference. When I say these were the options that he put to us, they were options put to us, they weren't um, obviously uh, firm recommendations, they were options put to us so that we could develop this paper for it to come to council. Um, so certainly um, there was a lot of discussion around it, but uh, at the end of the day, this was administration's recommendations based on the discussions we'd had with him. He did do a fair bit of assessment on the um, statistical um, uh, spread of current electors and what that would mean in terms of the next two ward boundaries. Um, the, sorry, the next two uh, ward um, reviews. Um, so that and that is obviously built into this paper as well. I guess my final comment is just in regards to the no ward. So I just want to focus on that for, um, for a moment, if that's okay, through you, Mayor, in regards to the consultant's view that we didn't vote along ward lines, which actually we can't um, under the Act, we, and that it made no significant difference. So I guess I want to go on the record really strongly and say it absolutely does make a difference to the election process. It absolutely... It is... It is actually, the, I think, a core in many ways of our identity as a city. People really, it is like the North-South River divide, right? You live on that side of the river or this side of the river. It really is. And I'm not sure how, the, how well the consultant knows our community. I've never heard of him. I don't know where he lives and what his experience is. The North-South ward system actually forms people's identity in the city of Vincent incredibly strongly. I get asked, what ward do I live in? Um, they certainly, certainly electors identify councillors as being in a ward. And once we come on here, we are a collegiate group. We do not vote um, in terms of our wards. The Act doesn't allow us to, actually, um, although that's not necessarily the case in other councils where they have a very strong affinity. We are a tiny little municipality, and therefore that is for election purposes. And I want to go on the record to say why it's for election purposes in terms of and its role in a democracy and that is to enable people off the street with limited resources to be able to have some chance of maybe getting elected or at least run um, what can be quite an expensive campaign where they print their own things you know on the on the smell of an oily rag it can make the difference of a person off the street giving it a go versus somebody who comes in needing 10 15 20 grand behind them, and that's not an exaggeration um, at all. Um, so I think it makes an incredibly big difference. Um, and I, you know, I would have liked to have seen some, maybe some more public debate and some workshops amongst our residents as well. But this council had a stated objective very strongly in our paperwork, our campaign that we won with state government about not backing a no ward system if we merged in with the city of Perth. We were adamant about it. And had, had we been merged, we would have won that argument too because we were able to convince the Premier and the Minister and our local member that we needed wards to represent our people properly. So I just want to go on the record. Um, I'm assuming, um, you know, I hope our community engages in, in this because that issue alone could see a very, very different council take place here and that is to do with big parties um, coming in, um, that is to do with people who've got a significant amount of money and there are, is always the perception that people who pay more for their campaign, you know, are, you know, maybe they have a high stake in, in the outcomes and stuff. I don't necessarily subscribe to that but I do support a person coming in off the street, Julie Wilcox comes to mind, no, 
back of, smell of an oily rag. She went out there, she walked, and she delivered, um, letter, you know, newsletters, and she got elected, and she won the most amount of votes. And she was an average person with no political connections whatsoever. And she's the example that I think is a really good thing about the city of Vincent. And the no ward system breaks that down in a very significant way. So I just want to go on the record as that because this consultant, whoever he is, does not know our community if he believed that that was a viable alternative um, to be putting out to our community for our, for our city. Thank you, Councillor Harley. The Acting CEO would just like to make a statement. Uh, through you, Mayor Collar, I will just um, bring to Councillor's attention the, the fact that this is a discussion paper and the, the options, and in fact under um, the options heading, um, it does clearly state that the options are for discussion purposes only and not intended to be all-encompassing. It also states that all options put forward will be considered in the review. So um, given that this is a discussion paper to, to, I guess, generate some of the questioning and some of the debate that um, we've spoken about in the last few minutes, um, it doesn't necessarily um, put forward the city's or council's position. Um, there is also the option, um, if council does still wish to proceed with the current time frame in the report to remove a particular option from this discussion paper if indeed it's something that council does not want to um, be in the discussion paper for the purposes of that community consultation. Um, so they are um, just two things that I thought would be important to bring to council's attention. Also, if you do refer to the time frames in the report, or more so the, the last or second last page of the discussion paper, um, you will see that whilst the city is to notify um, the advisory board of the outcome of its review by the 31st of January. Um, the board has then got between January and October 2019 to consider the review process. So that does really reaffirm um, the comments from the Director of Corporate Services that if Council does wish to defer this item, um, I would be confident that we can get that extension through the board and it have um, no impact. Thank you. Um, thank you, Sir, Acting CEO, for that clarification. Can I just um, clarify your statement that, and I acknowledge that this is a discussion paper, but that's never stopped this council from having strong views well before it goes out publicly, because we, we feel very connected to these um, to these discussions, and we have a history, um, all of us in varying, varying degrees. Um, are you saying that at this stage we could move an amendment and remove an option? Is that what you just said, that from this discussion paper we could, for example, say that we, we do not support an award system? Through you, Mayor Cole, what I'm proposing is the third recommendation is endorse the discussion paper, um, which is attachment one. Um, that discussion paper um, has not been released for the purposes of um, community consultation as yet. So um, Council could make the decision to um, have an, an amendment made to that discussion paper to remove one of the particular options under section three of that discussion paper before it's released for public comment. Right, can I just, just a point of clarification, the reason that I pulled this out for debate was with that knowledge that it is a discussion paper, but to highlight the fact that of all of the options, if you take the no ward and uh, no change options, there's always potential options within that are available, that it was about the intent of pulling it out was to take it to a forum where that can be debated rather than just pulling one out. That was the intent of actually bringing the item up so that it would be potentially deferred to allow for it to go for that very discussion. Can I just ask, that is definitely an opportunity which has been identified by the director as a possibility. Um, the other thing is, um, Acting Zero, I'm interested, like I, when I looked at Clause 3, endorses a discussion paper, I felt uncomfortable about that given that this had come to council. Um, I at first thought perhaps this is something that has to be reviewed independently of council. I've been trying to find um, schedule two, clause 6.1 or schedule 2.2, but unless this is actually a review that must be conducted at arm's length of council members, this is about representative democracy and who better place to have a view than the elected representatives. So um, I thought at first upon reading this that it must be that this review has to happen at arm's length and discussion paper potentially has to be developed, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So. Um, 
for example, if your reading of this acting CEO is that we are endorsing the discussion paper, I'm not comfortable with that. Um, I'm happy to, if we have to be at arm's length, my view is that I'm happy for it to be, to approve it for advertising, but not endorsing the discussion paper because we actually haven't really had an opportunity to have input into its development. Um, but if, if there is nothing to preclude council from actually being involved in in having a view on the discussion paper, then my preference would be that we defer and that we have an opportunity to discuss it. Through you, Chair. I'm happy to defer my deferral motion if there's more debate, but I'm going to foreshadow a deferral on this item. Basically. Can I just check, is there anyone that wishes to speak? Yeah, it's Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, look, I'd feel uncomfortable, and I appreciate that the intent of the potential deferral is to allow Council to have this discussion, but I, I want to be on the record to say I would feel uncomfortable about, if the purpose is to seek a broad range of community views, I would feel uncomfortable about removing options that we know exist from discussion papers. However, I do, and look, I think the other thing is, is that from my perspective, no change, no wards, change the boundaries or change the representation, that would appear to me to be a pretty reasonable selection of options to put forward to the community for discussion. I agree that perhaps they could have been more high level to explore rather than a specific boundary or you know, a specific approach to changing representation in each ward um, and, and that we could have sought the community views in, in that regard. That said, I think that it's fairly clear that this is a broad discussion paper. I note from the timeline this is, um, that this would come back um, for council endorsement in December. I presume then it would have to go through briefing and workshop processes um, and I wouldn't be endorsing something if I felt that the um, I wouldn't be um, able to endorse the outcomes of a review if I felt that the review hadn't been conducted appropriately, but I don't feel that this discussion paper is such that I, I can't let it go out and seek community views on the options. Um, I, given that the Mayor is unable to do this, I will propose an amendment that to recommendation three that says approves for is it release? Because we're not really advertising it. Or approves for a release for consultation. Um, the discussion paper titled Review of the City's Wards and Reputation, Representation, um, for the purposes of providing local public notice, etc., etc. Um, if anyone would like to second that. Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Gondoshevsky? I. I think it would be important, should we go forward, that we're comfortable with this wording, even if the specific wording within the discussion paper, you know, is not necessar has not necessarily been formulated in discussion um, and agreement with council. So I appreciate the mayor's sentiments in this regard, and I'm happy to put forward this amendment. Councillor Murphy. Yeah, look, I tend to agree. Um, I don't have any issue <clears throat> with the discussion paper as such. I mean, it's an interesting. Um, view around the boundaries, like whether Leaderville should be <clears throat> in the North Ward or not, that would be maybe my only concern <clears throat> in terms of what's there's probably a better way, perhaps, or more suitable in terms of, as you were saying, not the North East versus the South East and maybe carving it up a bit more. Um, but overall, I, you know, I don't have an issue. I, th I would support the recommendation as is for the for the point of um, open discussion. Councillors uh, on the uh, amendment. Uh, uh, um, yes, I'm really conflicted because um, I, I just, we are the decision makers in this and um, we shouldn't shy away from that. I'm not suggesting we are, but this is not an arm's length pro process from us. We are the council of decision makers and this absolutely, we are in a very good position to understand um, our, um, our municipality. I'm not saying the administration aren't, by the way. Um, I just feel like this needed more discussion. So um, I'm in a quandary because I in no way endorse the discussion paper. I do not understand how those options have been reached. I don't believe they reflect um, our history as a council, 20-year history as a council of having wards 
we've never at any point even wanted that. In fact, um, we've been very strongly. So I, um, I don't want to stand in the way of putting this out to the community, but um, this is an open council and we are on camera and I believe we are absolutely transparent in what we do, but I'm deeply uncomfortable with this going out in this form at the moment without us as a council having some input into the options. We may have other options. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that the, um, you know, that the um, consultant didn't canvas them all, but we may have other options that we want to go out to the community. And my question is, have we missed an opportunity in this process by not putting other options on the table that we believe could better reflect our community? Not just bringing in a bit of leadable and a bit of this and a bit of that. Maybe there are other communities of interest that we genuinely wanted to look at and actually talk to our community about the options rather than a discussion paper that just goes out for discussion and then it comes back to us and we may be in the unenviable position of having you know, options that we didn't have in really any say in what they looked like going out, having other options not considered and then voting them down. I actually think that's a worse outcome for our community and I would be very happy to go out and have discussions with the community in an open forum. We've got nothing to hide. This is not trickery. Um, so, um, you know, for I don't, I don't support the amendment um, and I will absolutely foreshadow a deferral for the purpose of further discussion. Um, councillors, I support the amendment because this motion may be supported, um, but I, I do agree with Councillor Harley. I think that my view is that if this is not an arm's length process and we are aware of, community, of our community, the communities of interest that, you know, I've been back from leave for two days, um, I think this is a significant issue for the Council. I would like to have some thought about are there other options that better suit our community. Um, I don't really want to rule things in or out tonight. I'd actually like to have a bit of time to think about it and to look at things like if we are going to divide the wards um, and realign the, the boundary is, you know, where is the right place to do that? Where are those communities of interest? So um, I do feel that this is an important process for the City of Vincent and I do feel, as, as Councillor Harley has has um, argued that in previous situations where we were confronting amalgamation in the city of Perth, we were looking at what would happen to our wards. Communities of interest was one of the, um, pr the principles behind um, amalgamations and why we were looking at not splitting Vincent and part of Vincent going to the city of Stirling and part of city of Vincent going to the city of Perth. So I think that there is, as elected members, we are not a consultant. We're the people that actually have a good understanding of our community and, and the way this system works. So I agree that we don't need to, it's not like we need to be at arm's length and go, oh, we're just going to put out a discussion paper because it's been presented to us. I think that there are potentially other ways of looking at this that haven't actually been discussed and I would like the opportunity to do that. And I agree that if we as a council um, feel that a one ward system is a, you know, not our philosophical position on how we get the best um, you know we talk about being the small, the, the, you know, the local in local government and you compare us to say the city of Stirling, I have discussions with city of Stirling um, councillors about you know, directly elected mayoral elections and how do they actually do that in the city of Stirling which is like what three or four times the size of a federal seat versus the city of Vincent where you know, I self-funded my first campaign as a as a council member. It's you know, and you have the ability to do that. It's a very different scenario, and I think that is part of our democratic representation. And I'm quite happy to have that discussion. I don't think that there's anything wrong with it. So um, I'm supporting the amendment, but should a deferral come forward, I'd also support that. Councillor Toppelberg. Whilst we're in the mood for foreshadowing. Um, just I know that so uh, after we've dealt with this amendment, uh, I I just note that I would likely seek to amend uh, the discussion paper. We're option still three. dealing with the amendment Correct. at the moment. I'm just foreshadowing okay. because you can't amend the amendment just in case a deferral comes gets voted down and this goes back up. But just uh, to uh, to make it clear that in the options for the change in that uh, sentence that the acting CEO referred to earlier in that preamble that it actually encourages people to submit other options if they feel that they have other options in case it gets up. Is there any further um, comment in relation to the amendment before us? 
Okay, I'll put all those in favour. All those against? Councillor Harley voting against. I'll declare the amendment carried We're back to the substantive. Thank Under you, Mayor. Amendment. <laughs> oh, I think the light, who got there first? I think the light's on over here. Uh, so, uh, so carrying on, so now three exists as, that's now the substantive motion. Uh, so after the words with two above in three, it would say subject to clause three being amended as follows. So, uh, oh, it's been copied in there, so you're not going to be able to cut and paste it out of there. So I'll just read it as I intend, and it'll it can be inserted in there. Uh, so it currently reads options for change to wards and representation. The city has put forward four options for ward and representation change to provoke discussion, encourage submissions and comments. Please note that these options are for discussion purposes only and not intended to be all encompassing. So the amendment would be that after the words encompassing to add the words, submitters are encouraged to consider these options and propose any other options. Any other options that they believe are viable to address any changes towards some representation. I'll speak to it. Seconded by Councillor Lowden. Yep, so I just think it's really important because otherwise it does effectively, if this does get up, it effectively says these are the four options that we're going to you with and uh, it, this just overtly says to people, if you have any other ideas, then please submit them. Councillor Lowden, do you wish to speak to it? Councillors, Councillor Harley. Um, I'm, um, I, again, I am torn because um, I do appreciate that um, people moving amendments is to try and make the unpalatable more palatable. Um, I'm not somebody who likes to make unpalatable things that are, in my opinion, unpalatable, palatable, because actually what I think we do is I think we do decision-making on the run, and that is what I feel that we are doing tonight. Um, I, so I'm torn because I support, in principle, more options coming forward from the public. I just resent the fact that we have not had that opportunity as a group of councillors to put our options on the table. Um, so as a member of the public, I guess I can take my councillor hat off and I can choose to conflict myself out of the vote that comes to council and then I can have my say and put my options forward through the public consultation. But I shouldn't have to do that because I'm an elected official and this is part and parcel of our role. So um, for the sake of not making what I think is an unpalatable um, motion more palatable. I'm, I'm going to vote against it and I'm going to continue to um, foreshadow that I will be moving a deferral motion um, whether the amendment gets up or not. Thank you. Further comments on the amendment? Councillor Murphy? Yeah, look, I support the amendment. Um, to me it feels uh, like a better outcome rather than us sort of going it away, taking it away and trying to manipulate some sort of outcome rather than just having an open discussion with everyone and putting all the options on the table. So I kind of feel that this um, satisfies that for me. So I'll be supporting the amendment. Happy to support the amendment, but um, I just don't feel comfortable with language such as manipulate because that is not at all my personal intention. Um, I think that, you know, as I said previously, um, it is the council that is making the decision in relation to this matter. It is the council that has had views in relation to representative democracy in the city of Vincent, and it is absolutely our role to um, have views and to um, be comfortable that whatever we put out to the community for discussion that we believe actually enhances our community's representation. I think that's a critical thing about what Vincent does. So I... You know, I feel quite uncomfortable about the use of the word manipulate because that 
um, could be taken in the wrong way, but I'll support the amendment on the previous basis that I supported the other amendment. Any further debate on the amendment? So I'm happy to retract the word manipulate. Thank you, I appreciate that. I'll put the amendment, all those in favour? Declare it carried. We're back to the substantive. Oh, sorry, Councillor Harley, apologise. Councillor Harley voting against the amendment. We're back to the substantive. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm going to move a deferral um, motion on this to allow for further discussion and um, more nuanced options. Is there a seconder? <coughs> Councillor Toppelberg. All those in favour? Declare it carried. And there was no one voting against? Okay, declare it carried. The item's been deferred. Uh, the next item is 11.7, .7, reallocation of 2018-19 budget funds, leadable town centre shared space, absolute majority decision. I have a mover and seconder, please. Moved Councillor Toppelberg, seconded Councillor Murphy. Councillor Murphy. Um, exciting proposal, um, uh, fully in support uh, thank you for finding the money. Um, the good word of the city uh, and their efficiency, um, meaning that this project can come up um, in the budget. So, um, yeah, look forward to, to seeing it potential. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Just one quick question. In relation to this matter that we're considering, this is about the reallocation of funds and, and doesn't necessarily or no forms a council approval of the design as presented in terms of, I believe it said somewhere that there would be some consultation on design, etc. And just wanted to check if that was the case. Um, through you, Mayor Cole, this, this is actually just about reallocation of the funds. It is a good question, though, for the Director of Engineering. What opportunity does the Council have to review the final plan for the shared space? Through you, Michael. I, I guess the answer is um, if you wish to review the design, we can, you know, we can certainly do that, whether that's through a workshop or... Yeah, I was afraid. I was afraid. I was afraid this would happen. No, I mean, the, if... if um, if you remember, so we had the original design as part of the budget process, and uh, what we've done is we've, we've extended the space that's covered by, um, you know, in the new plan. So the space has become larger, um, and we're, we're happy to proceed on that basis. But if councillors feel they need input into the specifics of the design, then that could be arranged. I think just specifically noting that the all trees that are currently in situ are represented on these plans and I feel it would be appropriate should there be any change to that that there would be an opportunity for discussion with council. Yeah, so you may call. Uh, there have been some questions I've received about that. So the, the, there has been a request to remove um, one of the trees in the median. So if you look in the median near the junction um, with Newcastle and... Um, New, uh, Newcastle and Oxford. Oxford. Yes, yeah, sorry, I got a bit lost then. There are four trees there. Three are, are large trees that are established. One is a sapling that we planted in the last two years. There's been a request to remove that tree because it makes the space more usable for markets, etc. So, as an administration, we're not opposed to the removal of that tree because it's, you know, it's not a significant tree. Um, and so, we'll be guided by council if that's appropriate or if you wish to, um, to discuss that further. I can answer that question. I think what Councillor Gondoshevsky is indicating that on the plans that are attached to this item, even though it's about budget reallocation, they show that all trees are in place. So if there is to be a change to those plans, I think there's definitely an interest from council members to be given the opportunity for comment. Uh, through you, Michael. So we can definitely do that. The question is, do we f do it formally through a council report or do we do it informally um, through other mechanisms, and I could be guided by council on that. Personally, I'd be happy with that being circulated via email. Is there anyone that would object to that? Okay, thank you. Any further comments in relation to the shared space? 
I do just want to acknowledge that um, Leadville Connect um, really were champions of this project. They came to us and said that they would love to see um, this space become the um, Piazza of Leadville, um, see its great potential for smaller and more regular road closures and um, they're really hoping to be involved in the curation of this space. And also, um, it, you know, while we've had to allocate some funds, it still is a relatively low cost project for a um, project of this size and I think that's because, you know, City of Vincent has got a very good in-house um, engineering team. So, so I think that's a pretty good outcome and really looking forward to the space being prepared in, in before Lady Palooza. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, I'll put all those in favour. Declare it carried. Next item is 12.1, Management of Services at World Square for People Experiencing Homelessness. This is an absolute majority decision. Councillor Harley moving, Councillor Hallett seconding. Um, I obviously uh, support this motion and I'm very pleased to see that the meal service has continued at Manor Inc. I acknowledge all the hard work um, of the administration and um, you know Director Quirk's team as well. Uh, this is a very important service for our homeless and street present people um, and it has successfully, not without its problems, but it has successfully been moved from the night time to, um, to the daytime, which is um, a very good negotiation and a very good outcome. Um, it's a very, it's a much better outcome for um, the clients as well because um, many of them were going long periods of time um, without eating. So by the time they were coming to the meal service, they were juiced up, they were sh they were sugared down. There was all sorts of problems um, going on. So I'm pleased to see it's going to continue. I think the conditions that we've put in there are um, are reasonable. I'm just um, wanting to double check on um, section one where well, the wording says for a period of 12 months con concluding 30th of November 2019 and um, through you um, Mayor to the uh, oh. okay, sorry um, and I may have missed this but is there anywhere in here where it talks about at what point we're going to be going back to Manor Inc to have a discussion with them um, ahead of that November 2019 expiry uh, and if there's not could I um, happy to move an amendment but also obviously just to make a suggestion that um, an that period of time would be very important um, to Manor Inc and for the city so that again we're in a no surprises environment um, that we're in an evidence base where if we've had problems we've got plenty of lead in time to do that negotiation so a service doesn't um, go into stress and switch off particularly in the lead up to Christmas. Uh, through you Mayor Cole, well, it may not specifically be articulated in the recommendations, administration uh, are liaising with Manor Inc on a, on a weekly if not um, fortnightly basis so uh, the level of dialogue particularly between our community partnerships team and Manor Inc is as regular and consistent as it, as it ever has been. Certainly an important milestone over the next 12 months will be uh, the outcomes of the City of Perth Homelessness Framework Committee that no doubt will, will throw out some recommendations and potential improvements to Manor Inc and, and broader services. So that, that milestone which is certainly picked up um, in recommendation three um, will certainly be a milestone for administration to then actively engage with Manor Inc about the future of their service. Um, happy to better articulate that if you wish but that's certainly administration's intention. Councillors, Councillor Toppelberg. Just a question about the unauthorised services, and so uh, I'll ask the question through to you. Um, and I understand from the report, obviously we alert unauthorised operators, whether they be a business or individuals, that they can't operate without approval. What else is is that it? Is that pretty much what we do? Is if because I know that uh, one of the service providers sent a fairly terse email to elected members this year basically saying you have no right to stop us from offering this free service. We can, obviously we can, but can we just get some clarity around what role Manor does or doesn't play within that and whether uh, it, uh, I understand that whilst it's obviously a, a community based service that there are, um, that there are issues associated with it. Um, I just want to apologise to the seconder, Councillor Hallett, I'll come back to you, I'm sorry about that. 
uh, through you, Mayor Cole, as Councillor Toppleberg rightly states, um, we, we can prevent uh, that from occurring. However, administration, particularly through our ranges, have been quite um, sympathetic um, to that approach in, in the sense that uh, these are generally volunteer organisations, um, well-meaning organisations. Uh, so some of them have taken it well. For example, Salvation Army identified that um, they would be better off um, directing their resources elsewhere and their, their service ceased immediately. Um, some of the other service providers have disappeared for a period of time and then and then returned. And that, that really is why administration has been so keen on partnering not just with the City of Perth but the broader um, community services sector because that is a a widely held view that there are lots of well-meaning people and organisations that aren't necessarily directing their resources in the right spot. Um, so um, we will continue to um, redirect people from World Square because whilst Manor Inc um, delivered their services there, we do think it's important that uh, World Square doesn't necessarily become the hotspot for all services um, for all people who are, are sleeping rough and experiencing homelessness. So that's where we are hopeful that the, the outcomes of this homelessness framework um, committee will assist us in better dealing with those unauthorised service providers. What the answer is at this point in time, I, um, I can't tell you, but um, we're certainly committed to identifying what that response is in, in collaboration with the sector. Thank you, Acting CEO. Um, seconder, Councillor Hallett. Just a, a couple of questions in relation to the homelessness framework. Um, the report mentions about three working groups um, and active engagement by the city in the unsolicited distribution. Are we involved in the other two? Um, and then just a second question about when the framework is completed by the end of 2018, um, and that's formally presented to Council. Um, what format will that take? Will it be a series of recommendations um, and is there scope for that to come to workshops for more detailed kind of discussion about how we can implement things from that? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, the City of Vincent is directly represented on the Unsolicited Services Working Group. However, we sit on the committee, so all three of the working groups are bringing their findings and recommendations back to that committee, so we do certainly have oversight and the opportunity for input. Um, and, and yes, look, at the end of the day, the framework will bring back a range of recommendations. Some of those may not indeed be relevant to the City of Vincent. Um, a lot of them, I think, will be. Um, and with the intention of bringing it back to Council, uh, we can certainly bring it to a, a workshop rather than a briefing session. And I think that may be particularly important because the, all of the recommendations on mass will just not be relevant for council to adopt in a, in a, in a formal council meeting. So um, I can certainly provide that commitment. Councillors. So I just have one more um, comment and, um, oh, sorry, I don't want to. Have you the mover, the mover. Okay. Do you mind if I, does anyone no, else wish not. to speak? Of course not. Before the um, move closes debate, I just want to comment that um, a lot of work goes into the management of the Manor Inc service. There's a huge amount of liaison between our staff. We've got Noongar Patrol on board. Uh, as you can see from the report, it details all of the patrols that the Rangers do and that they are um, really trying to keep track of litter issues and antisocial issues. But there are people that live around World Square that are residents and business owners that do have concerns and that do contact, um, you know, from time to time. Um, and I think that... Um, a lot of the issues that are attributed to Manor Inc are much broader um, in this location. It is, um, it, you know, it is just a part of the city that has always attracted homeless people experiencing homelessness. There is a lot of service provision in the area, as the, as the report states. And I think that, um, that the acting CEO and his team do a fantastic job of really working um, in close liaison with Manor Inc, wanting it to be a success. We want to be able to provide this um, assistance through Manor Inc um, to those homeless people who need support um, and we want to be able to balance that with the amenity of residents and I think that since we've moved to the lunchtime um, timing, I note that this is even 45, 15 minutes shorter than their current approval and I'm hoping that Manor Inc are, ha are happy with that and comfortable that they can still deliver the service but you know there has been a lot of change, a lot of work with Manor Inc to try to make this 
service exist and to be successful and to also protect the amenity of those residents that also wish to use World Square. As you can see, there's no meal service happening on the weekend. Um, it is trying to achieve that balance of use of World Square for those adjoining residents as well. So I'd just like to um, say thank you to, um, to Mick and also um, officers like Kate who do a lot of work in this area. Any further comments? Uh, would, do you wish to close debate, Councillor Harley? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, obviously, um, um, the service will continue for 12 months and hopefully into the future. And just um, picking up um, on a couple of comments, um, and I acknowledge that there are ongoing issues. Obviously, World Square has always been a gathering um, um, place for Aboriginal people um, in people's living memories. It is still a gathering place and over the years has also um, attracted street present um, people and we've worked very hard as a council to improve that park generally which actually improved the safety um, and I acknowledge all the work done by um, by your team and other um, um, other areas of the administration um, as well I would um, welcome a report back to the um, to one of our workshops where people can you know have, get a good cross section of everything that's happening in this space with those um, different committees. I think that would be really good and I encourage anyone who's got spare time on their hands, I'm sure you all do, to um, f go and check it out like from the time that they start making their meals over in Vic Park to when they go over to the park, hand them out, go back and they do the wash up. Um, I've done it a number, of, uh, a number of times so I could understand the service a bit better and understand their client a bit better, um, their clients a bit better and I'd encourage anyone who hasn't done it if you've got the time to do it, it's a really, a really interesting um, experience. So, um, uh, thanks to your um, team, acting director, acting CEO, and acting director, and the other um, teams for all the hard work in keeping that service there. I think it's um, critical that it stays there, particularly at a time where City of Perth is moving their street present and homeless people out of their city. It's even more important. So. That closed debate. So I'll put the motion. All those in favour? I declare it carried. Uh, that was the final item other than a confidential item 18.1. So that will end our live stream this evening and I do thank people for joining us and wish you a good evening.